a couple stories actually here that are going to be going um, not the next video, but the one after that. I'm trying to line everything up so I can get back into an actual consistent upload schedule because it's been really hard with my health bullshit, but I'm trying to power through it and get back to where it used to be. So I do have a couple stories that are saved up and they're not going to be in the next video, but they'll be in the one after that. So I guess you can consider this like a a sneak preview or something like that. So we'll go ahead and try to zoom in so I can actually read what's on the screen. Hold on one sec. What up, Margo? I see you. I see you. A lot of people from Texas. Glad you all made it. I appreciate it. Alright, so this story is submitted on Let's Not Meet. And it's actually really highly rated. It's submitted by I Wanted That Iced. And it's got 1.8 thousand upvotes in two days. Which for Let's Not Meet is amazing. And it is one that I have permission for, and it will be in an upcoming video. So, uh, consider this like an early listen. It is titled, I Think Someone Tried to Kidnap Me. Back when I was a kid, my mom and I had a deal. She'd schedule all my scarier appointments, like dentist visits and vaccines in the morning, and if I went without fussing or whining too much, I'd get to play hooky for the rest of the school day, and we'd get lunch, go to the mall, and see a movie. This was one of those days. It was a few weeks before Christmas, but the mall was pretty quiet because it was around one on a weekday. I'd had my picture taken with Santa, we'd done some Christmas shopping and had lunch at my favorite restaurant, and we were going to finish our day with whatever kid's Christmas movie was playing at the time. I don't remember which one it was, but I remember how fun and pleasant the day had been. The theater itself was almost empty, just my mom and I and a few parents with kids too young to be in school. A few minutes later, a single man walked in. I remember him entering because I thought it was weird he didn't have any kids with him, and because he seemed to spend a long time surveying the theater, the way people do when they're trying to find a seat or two in a crowded auditorium. I remember him staring at me for quite a while, but then he sat down near the door and I didn't think too much of it. A girl I played with in my neighborhood was had really strict parents and they always went to see kids' movies alone first to be sure they'd approve of them. Maybe his kids went to school with me and he recognized me, but that is why his eyes had lingered. Just as the preview started, I realized I needed to pee. I had just turned eight a few months earlier, and my mom finally letting me do things like that without her accompanying me. As I got up to go, my mom slipped me a $10 bill and told me to get us some candy and soda. A real treat in my house. I was so excited to be trusted to go by myself and to get candy that I almost didn't notice the man from earlier got up and followed closely behind me as I left the theater. Almost. As I was allowed to do things by m as I was allowed to do things by myself more, my parents had drilled into me that I always needed to be aware of my surroundings and anything that felt off. And by the way, he bolted from his seat to follow me out of the theater. Felt off. To give a little context, the movie theater was attached to a mall. So the main entrance was through the mall itself. To make getting out a little easier, there was a few exit doors that led to the parking lot. The restrooms were right next to these. The man followed me all the way to the woman's bathroom. Not close enough immediately to spook me, but if I hadn't noticed if I hadn't noticed him, but close enough that any passerby would assume he was my father trailing behind his daughter. After I got to the restroom, I peeked out. He had stationed himself just outside the entrance to the bathroom on the side closest to the exit. I told myself that maybe he needed to use the bathroom too, but clearly he didn't. So I peed and then I waited, and waited. 
I heard a man's voice just outside. Joke with someone about how he was waiting for his, his daughter who was dwaddling. I knew my mom wouldn't get worried and come to look for me immediately because she would assume I was in line to get snacks. But I couldn't get back to her without going past the man. You got them sugar buns. Finally, a nice num -num sugar looking buns. older woman came in. As she was leaving, I told her I'd forgotten how to get back to my theater where my mom was waiting and asked if she could walk me there. I held her hand tightly as she tear cheerfully told me that she was glad to help. As we left, the man waiting took a quick step forward, like he'd been waiting to grab me. When he saw that I was with the woman, he turned around and left out the exit door. I made it back to my mom without incident. I told her I didn't see any candy that I wanted, and I was kind of full for my lunch anyway. In hindsight, I should have told her right away about the creepy guy that followed me, but I was afraid that I'd lose my precious new independence. But looking back as an adult, I still can't figure out any benign intentions that would explain his actions, and I desperately hope that he didn't catch some other little girl unaware. Anani Mouse, thank you so much with a $15 donation says, fuck YouTube. Thanks so much, dude. You even do that through the Streamlabs. Much love, bro. Yeah, Streamlabs is the is the way to go if you're wanting to support that creator more on YouTube. That's why I never brought back my uh, channel members. Yes, I could probably make a little bit of extra money from that, but I don't want to reward YouTube for their shenanigans they're pulling on our community. So, I will just take that. Thanks so much, dude. Glad you made the stream. Margot says, best story voice ever. I have a horrible story voice right now. My voice, I think, is perfect when I just wake up. When I wake up, I have like a natural deepness to my voice that I can't control. It's just whenever I talk. Seems like the more I wake up, the more nasally it kind of gets. But it also could be my health issues because my sinuses are always completely jacked up. Mm-hmm. Sad4 says, bro, swear to God, you sound almost identical to Let's Read. You know, bro, that's the craziest shit. I hear that so much. But the funny thing is, when him and I collaborated, I go to the comments on his video and they're like, your maker sucks at narrating. He needs to get into the story instead of just reading it. And I'm like, bro, I hear how much I sound like him. It's crazy. I had someone else tell me today, too. They're all, you should get into the stories a little more. It would make it more entertaining, and I was like, not gonna happen. I've unsubscribed from channels because they get too into the stories. I'm more of one of those just read the damn story type of thing. That was actually a big reason I got into narrations. I, I couldn't get in. I love horror books, like Stephen King, all that. But I can't stand the narrators they get because they just get too into the story. I... I'm one of those extremely picky people when it comes to television shows, movies, any of that. Like, I get extremely annoyed by a single character just being too into it. I find it corny. That's just my thing. That's why I watch a lot of the quote-unquote reality shows. Is I just can't get into a lot of acting. And, uh... So, yeah, that's gonna be one thing I don't do is get crazy into my stories. I, I, I'm one of those people just read the damn story. Type of thing. So, you like it, you like it, you don't, I don't care. I really don't. There's so many other narrators that people could follow. Jackie, I see you up in here. What's going on, Jackie? Good to see you. I saw you were walking to work in the rain. Hopefully your day wasn't all shitty or isn't all shitty. Margo says, that's your style. I love it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Big Boss says, you sound alike, but your styles are different. I used to narrate a lot differently when I started, actually. When I when I first started, I didn't have a microphone. And I was recording, I would go out in my car. So that, because my voice has a lot of bass. Like, you can't even pick up all the bass on, on the microphone. But like, my wife, when I'm talking in my God voice, I call it my God voice. She's all, you need to do that voice, you sound like Morgan Freeman. I was like, it's hard to do it on the spot. But it's just one of those voices where you just got like, super commanding. And uh... 
man, it'll hurt her eardrum. It'll hurt my eardrums too if I don't, if I'm like next to a wall where it'll reverb. But anyways, I was out in my car and I'd, I'd read a lot differently. I'd read a lot softer because I wanted to make sure that my voice didn't bounce off of everything. But as I got a mic and started soundproofing things, I decided to go back to my normal voice. So that turned a lot of people off, but uh, I don't care. Gene says, I did say hi to your maker and everyone. What's up, Gene? Thanks for dropping in. Yeah, Jer um, not Jeremy. Jeremy said, true, I like both types of narration. And, that, and that's what it's about. Some stories, you know, and that's, even when I was listening to stories, there were some that they didn't get too much into it, but they got a little bit into it. So it was enough that I could stay into. But then there were some that was just like, I'm totally into the story. And let me tell you, I was a dick before I came, became a channel. All these people that comment hate on my videos, I hold nothing against them because I was the same fucking way. Because I didn't know how shit worked. And I was uh, one of those people that speak my mind. I still am. They tell you don't respond to hate comments. Well, fuck that shit, man. Oh, by the way, there's going to be a lot of cursing. So if any youngins are around, I don't edit out my cursing either. I am what I am. But anyways, yeah, I'd, I'd call him out and be like, I was totally into your story until you started talking like a bitch. I'm a dick. Yes. I probably shouldn't always be so uh, honest when I'm live streaming, but uh, that is me. I'm always a blunt person, and it's got me in a lot of trouble. That's why if anyone ever asks me for advice, expect blunt advice. I even told my wife when we first got together, we sat down and had a conversation. I was like, look, I'm an adult. You're an adult. If I want to go somewhere, I'm going to go somewhere. I'll tell you about the time I'm going to be back and where I'm going just out of courtesy, but don't ask what I'm doing, and I'm not asking permission. I'm an adult. I don't need a parent again. And, uh... I also told her that I'm very blunt. So if she ever asks me, do I look fat in this? You will get an honest answer. I'm not one to sugarcoat things, which seems to turn a lot of people off, but that is what it is. JJG says, I listen to your stories when I'm going to bed and I'll risk the nightmare. Nightmares are always the best. I love nightmares. I even tell my wife, if I ever have a nightmare, don't wake me up. It's like a horror movie that you get to live through. I don't remember my dreams very much, but when I do, I hope for a nightmare. One that's just normal. Like, I remember the last nightmare that I actually did remember. You got them sugar um, bones. I'm kind of, not kind of experienced, but I know about bones. lucid dreaming, and there's times where I'm lucid dreaming. For those of you that don't know, lucid dreaming is essentially... You know you're dreaming in your dream, so you can kind of manipulate it. Oh, thanks so much, JG. JJG. Sisters, I appreciate you. Thank you. But, uh, it was a zombie dream, and I remember there was a whole, fam whole family that were all running from these zombie things. And it was, like, at that point that I realized I was in a dream. So, like, it's fun as hell. Once you actually realize you're in the dream, you do stupid shit. Like, I ran up to the zombies and just put out my arm, and they just start eating my arm, and then... Like, it's the funniest shit. It's hard to explain, but, uh, nightmares are awesome. We'll just put it that way. My favorite stories to narrate. Um, hmm. It doesn't matter, as long as it's well-written and it's creepy and scary. I've been, I've been a long-time horror fan. I grew up on Goosebumps and all kinds of stuff like that, so I have a wide plethora of stories that I can enjoy. It's more or less if it's well-written... And if it uh, conveys the, the fear that you would feel in that situation. Th those are my favorite stories. But I wouldn't say a specific topic. If I had to go with story stories, it would be true scary stories. That's what got me into the story. The paranormal stories, I do those for my viewers that enjoy the paranormal stories. Like, I, I do enjoy paranormal stories, but not as much as true scary stories. So those ones are more for the viewers. Like the video you got today, that's actually transferred from my old second channel that got screwed over by YouTube. I'm slowly merging the channels. Same with the other paranormal stories. But uh, me personally, I like true scary stories. Like things that are everyday scenarios that go awry type of thing. Because uh, a lot of those just come out of nowhere. And they're things you can't really predict. As much as you want to, you can't always predict it. Bad vibes, I see you dude. What's up? 
said for I enjoyed my first sleep paralysis. I laughed it off. I've never experienced sleep paralysis. AKA Game No Kyla, what's up? I'm glad you made it here. It says love the timing here. My hometown looks like Silent Hill right now. The road I live on looks like something out of Friday night 13. As is on sunny days. I sent a picture the other day to a family member because the fog here... We're in the desert of Arizona, and the fog looked like something straight out of a horror movie. It was insane. You literally couldn't see 20 feet in front of you. So I, I know what you're talking about with all the creepy weather. Lucinda says, I wish you could narrate the man in the brush. That's not neat. That, that sounds familiar. I wonder if I did in the past. I don't remember. Might have. Maybe uh, email me a link. Because all the stories I do on Reddit, I link the sources. So I can actually search all my videos from a URL. It makes it a lot easier. Nani Mouse said, I never had a nightmare from these, but did dream that I was being watched. Like something just over me on the couch, enough to jump myself awake. This morning, when I was trying to get s to sleep. <clears throat> okay. You know how, like, okay, for me, it's my wife and I who live in this house. But, like, there's this weird, I'm sure some of you notice when you turn a television on, there's almost this weird, you don't even have to be in the same room, but almost immediately, like, you feel this almost weird static in the back of your head. Like, you know the TV just turned on. You hear that, but it wasn't actually putting a sound out. Like, you're, you pick up on that, I don't know, the electricity, whatever the f hell it is. Fuck. Sorry, I was editing myself. Why do I do that? But whatever it was, you hear that. Well, you also get kind of a feeling like that when someone else is like watching you or in the room with you. That weird buzzing feeling that they've actually find sense behind where it feels like. I had that so bad this morning when I was trying to go to sleep. I kept opening my eyes like tripping out because I swear someone was just standing over me. It was the weirdest damn thing and I haven't felt anything like that in forever. Well, not forever, but a long time. Crazy. JJG says, I've been here since 80,000, and I don't know how you don't have a million. It comes down to the algorithms, my dude. It really does. Like, uh, I used to be getting 1,000 subs a day when I first started. But then uh, once my health issues start getting really bad and I start getting a little more lazy on top of it with my videos, the algorithm is going to hate you. So a lot of my videos don't show up in recommended. So that's a big reason I'm trying to get back more consistent is so that way I can start showing up and recommend it again because uh, I too have been missing my views and growth for sure. Yeah. But I feel you, dude. Okay. Well, I think what we'll go ahead and do is I'll get these stories going. This uh, The stories you're going to hear are some more paranormal stories. These are stories that are getting transferred over from my second channel. Well, yeah, my second channel, over to my main channel. These will be the ones that are probably coming out tomorrow. These ones have actually been up for my patrons for probably almost uh, a day and a half now. I've been waiting for YouTube to deem that they're advertiser-friendly, but they have not. So I might have to re-upload it and change the title again. But uh, this will be the next video you guys get. So for those of you that are here, you're going to get early access to it. For those of you that miss it, it will be live on the channel tomorrow, or you can go back in the stream. So, uh, yeah. Guinea pigs are doing great. Gotta trim their nails tonight, but they're doing good. Big old fat happy piggies. For those of you who don't know, I have two guinea pigs and two cats. Okay. Uh, scariest creepy pasta I know. Uh, the scariest one for me that I really enjoyed, I wouldn't say scariest, but I really liked it, was uh, the Russian sleep experiment. One I've never, never narrated, but I've heard it narrated a million times. That's why I haven't done it. But I love that story. I think it's an awesome story. Um, okay, so what's going to go on is I'm going to, like I said, play those stories. But at the same time, I'm going to switch the background up. You're going to be just seeing a video game in the background. Just a scary video game. And uh, that's me actually playing live. You shouldn't hear any of it. You're just going to hear the stories playing. But... uh. Yeah, that's what's going to be going on in the background. Now, let me find this video. All right, here we go. All right, I'm going to mute myself on my mic, and we're going to listen to some stories together while I uh, die in the background. 
Let me uh, mute this fire too. All of my life I've seen and experienced the paranormal. My earliest memories of seeing such things go back to when I was in preschool and have continued until recently. I'm 23 now, so it's been going on for a while. I had something dark attached to me until I was 20. It was really a terrifying experience as whatever this thing was, was aggressive and followed me everywhere I went. I had been able to finally get rid of this with the help of a Wiccan friend of mine. It wasn't very long after this original thing had been removed before this experience happened. After the thing attached to me was removed, I had began to notice something else following me, though it kept its distance. I would notice movement out of the corner of my eye, only for it to be gone every time I faced it directly, or I would see something pacing at the edges of light sources. I saw this just about everywhere I went, especially at night. I could tell by how this felt that it was not the dark spirit that had been with me once before, and because I had recently freed from it, I felt cocky and brazen. So one night, I went out of my room and went outside and called into the night for this thing, telling it I wasn't afraid of it and demanding it to stop lurking about and show itself. I don't know why I did this when I knew better but I called it out. It didn't take very long for shit to hit the fan. Where I lived at the time was in the middle of nowhere in northern Idaho. There was a main house where my mom, stepdad, and two sisters lived, and then there was a shop where mine and my brother's rooms were. The shop was a good distance away from the main house, so if I needed anything, I would need to leave this shop and go outside and go up a hill to get to the house to get anything whether it be food, water, or to use the restroom, as the bathroom built in the shop didn't even work. The layout of where I lived will come in later. So after I called this thing out, stuff started to happen. Something began hitting and pounding the walls outside my room. It moved around the building, not just staying to one side. This happened every night, right about at sunset. Then, Late at night I would hear something moving around in the shop. It sounded like someone was in there and moving things around, but there were never any signs of anyone having been in there when I would check in the morning, and the doors were locked, and no one but us had a key to the place. One night I was up late, scared shitless by everything going on at this point, when I got the feeling that I was being watched. I turned and looked at my window, and there was a face pressed against it, staring at me. It was completely white, and it almost looked like a mask with how still it was. It didn't have eyes. It just had two black pits on its otherwise white face with a blank expression. I screamed, and when I did, the face just disappeared. Not like something ducked away or ran. It was just like it was there one second, and then it was gone. Like it had never been there to begin with. The next night I was up late, and I just wanted to go to the bathroom. I left my room and went to hurry up to the main house when I heard something come running up behind me. It sounded big and was breathing heavy, and I booked it to the main house with this thing chasing me the entire way. I had glanced over my shoulder when I first heard something, but there was nothing there, but I still heard something coming after me. I told my family about this, and they just sort of laughed it off like I was making it up even though most of my family had experienced something paranormal before. My stepdad was the worst with it, as he didn't believe in ghosts or anything of the like. He often made fun of me about the being chased up to the house part, saying I just heard myself breathing or something of the like, and often would mock me about the heavy breathing part. My stepdad never once being a nice man, and even though he could tell I was terrified about what was going on, he continued to mock me about it. After a week of stuff going on, it just sort of stopped. I never saw it or sensed the thing again, and nothing else involving it occurred. I guess it was simply showing me what it could do, and left once it decided I was sufficiently scared. And believe me, by the end of it I was. I learned my lesson from this, and have never called out spirits or anything else I saw again, 
and I haven't had anything else like this happen since. This takes place between the years of 1993 and 2001, and actually continues on. A little backstory to paint a more complete picture. I was raised judo Christian, and the paranormal was a touchy subject. The main point my father drilled into my head was, do not talk to ghosts. There is no absolute way of knowing their true intentions. My childhood home, the house my great-grandparents once lived in, and now myself at six years old, was a 1930s farmhouse set in southwest New Jersey on 10 acres of property. I remember being excited about living on a farm. No more moving. My dad had just retired from the military, and the opportunity to make real friends meant everything to me. But reality reared its ugly head, and what I thought would be a peaceful, stable existence turned into a nightmare. I could sense tension between my parents and it in turn made me depressed. So much so I tried taking my life when I was eight. I didn't tell my parents the whole story why I was so sad. It wasn't just the late night arguments. It was the house. I heard people walking up and down the basement stairs. I saw and heard two men in the basement where our television sitting room and desktop computers were. And there was what I thought was a little girl in my room. For several years, ages 6 through 13, 1993 through 2000, I saw this thing. Light shoulder length hair, piercing eyes, white nightdress, and a bluish aura. We would talk and play in my room. Sometimes I could feel her outside when feeding the animals or walking through our large property. At first she was nice. Then she started saying dark things. Your parents are done. No more family. You can be happy with me. After the failed suicide attempt, I stopped talking to the thing in my room. I tried telling my parents about the activity in the later years, 8 through 13, but they brushed it off. They even took me to a psychologist, and I was part of a child study for a new drug for depression slash ADD. I withdrew, starting to self-harm because no one would believe me, and my parents were dragging out a dead marriage. At 14, I snapped. Hard. My parents were having another epic late night argument on a school night. When things finally quieted down around 3 a.m., I remember thinking that I can nap for now, feed the animals, sheep, goats, ducks, etc., real quick before the bus, sleep for 25 minutes till school, then go to the nurse and finally tell an adult I trusted what was going on and maybe sleep through first period. My eyes started to close. My door was shut. Tigger and Chaz, my cats, could be heard eating their food and chasing something in the kitchen. Something sat on my bed. I had a full flotation water bed. Basically a fart will make the bed move. There was a visible and physical thing sitting in the left corner of my bed. I felt that feeling again. That thing was on my bed. I was so pissed. For years, I've been experiencing things that no one will believe. My parents were constantly at each other's throats. Now with maybe the opportunity to get three hours of sleep, this thing decides to disrupt that? I screamed at the top of my lungs, get the fuck off my bed, get the fuck away from me and just fuck off. My mom came running into my room and I told her to let me be. That, you never believed me in the past, why would you believe me now? That was the last time I experienced that pseudo ghost girl. I still saw the guys in the basement, heard their whispers and footsteps, even saw an old lady in our sunroom, but no more bedroom haunts. After my parents divorced and my dad started dating, his girlfriend blessed my room. She was one of the few people who believed me. My dad believed that I believed it was real. He wasn't mean or dismissive. His religion just makes him weary of the supernatural and stories of experiences. Basically, if there's no proof, you can neither accept or deny the situation. Fast forward to the present day. I've moved out, got married, have a kid, and am living my life. About six months ago, my dad calls and starts asking questions about the girl. 
I told him it's not a girl. And then he drops a bombshell. It happened to me, kiddo. She sat on my bed, but she was at the right corner of my bed, near my closet. Dad, you realize its position is mirrored exactly. Did she point to the closet, which would be the far wall of your room? No, it never pointed at anything. My last experience was feeling its presence, that hungry sadness, and my pent-up rage and frustration. I told my dad to tell it to go away, call a rabbi for a blessing. He went to high school and is still friends with him anyway. My father is stubborn and hasn't done anything about it. If he is still experiencing whatever that thing is, he won't share. I don't know what to think about the situation, why the positions were mirrored, why it decided to lay dormant for almost 14 years, or why it was pointing to my room where it once sat all those years ago. I'm an idiot, I thought I'd get away. I was 20 years old and just had my second child. My family and I had just moved into a house on a property which had another house on it. It was fenced, in a perfect place for children to roam. Or so I thought. The other house, which was two stories, was unoccupied. It was totally condemned. The owners of the property said it's been in the family for decades. It had burned down some years before. They never really wanted to reconstruct it. My sister had moved in with us due to a domestic violence situation. She told me one day that she was going to explore the ruins of the old house. I told her she was crazy, but my sister was adventurous, despite all the bad things she had endured. She took off out the door and started towards the house. It was probably hours until she came back with baby blankets and an old baby cradle still intact. I told her those weren't ours, and we could get in trouble for stealing them. She shrugged it off and said lightly, What they don't know won't hurt them. And besides, I thought my little nephew could use them. I looked at her puzzled, but there was no convincing her of anything, so I just let it go. Later that night, I was residing in the living room on the sofa watching TV. The cradle was between the kitchen and our living room. I planned to clean it up the following morning. I noticed from my side vision that the cradle began to rock gently and slowly. I shrugged it off as a gust of wind, so I went back to watching TV. Then I thought I heard a baby cry. I checked on my baby, and he was fast asleep. I began to get very alarmed at that moment. My sister had washed the blankets she had found in the house. My son was wrapped in them. I began to assume the items were possessed or something. Then I thought I was going nuts. I went back to watching TV and eventually went to sleep. I awoke to my cell phone ringing. The time said 3 or 4 a.m. I really can't remember. I answered it. I got no response. It was just a heavy breathing. Then it hung up. Okay. At this point I am freaked the hell out and didn't sleep the remainder of the night. Morning came, and I told my sister to put all the things back where she had found them. She started laughing, and said that I was watching too many scary movies. She asked me when my oldest daughter, Tina, got home. I looked at her puzzled. She's spending the weekend at her father's. My sister looked panicked. She said frighteningly, I saw a little girl up in Tina's room last night waving at me. I had my door open, I assumed. Then she stopped dead in her sentence and pointed behind me shakingly. The cradle began to rock again slowly, then faster and faster. Then I had my mom come over to help me watch my baby. We got all of the stuff out of the house and began to place the items back in the condemned house. I asked my sister how she got in there. She explained that there was a broken window on the bottom story, so we went through it. The house smelled like mold and mildew, furniture covered with plastic garbage bags and debris everywhere. There was a staircase leading to the other story. My sister told me she found the items upstairs in an old-fashioned nursery, 
and as we all began to make our way upstairs, we heard a child laugh. We paused for a moment. We were only halfway up the stairs when we saw a little girl about the same age as my daughter. She wore a brown dress with black shoes, pigtails, and a beautiful little nose. She was holding something wrapped in a blanket. Then she disappeared in what seemed like seconds. We went into the room, placed the objects in there, and began to head out. Then we thought we smelled smoke. My sister said, Do you smell that? It smells like a 4th of July barbecue. I began to panic, and so did my sister, so we ran fast out of there. As we were running, I looked back to see the girl peeking out the second story window, waving goodbye. I felt so bad for her, like I wanted to adopt her or help her. We moved shortly after that. We looked into the history of the house and the property. It turns out that in 1939, the house had been burned down due to a fireplace being left unattended. A family with two small children, a girl, and an infant were killed in the fire. It never fails that the second I let go of a skill check, something like that happens. I want to give a big shout out to everyone who's dropping in for the stream. Uh, what we're doing is we're listening to the next video that's going to be coming out. It's one that was actually posted for my patrons like a day and a half ago. And uh, we're listening to them as I'm playing this game live in the background. I was on my back porch playing, hence why uh, I was just teabagging in front of the killer. I don't know why he didn't kill me. I guess he felt sorry for me. So, uh, works for me. But yeah, I want to give a big shout out to everyone dropping in. I really do appreciate it. And I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. And uh, we're listening to some stories together. These ones are paranormal. After this, I'll get some uh, older ones from my channel that are since unlisted. So that way you guys can hear new ones at least. So, uh, yeah, I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. I see you, Teddy. Glad you made it up in here, brother. For those that don't know, Teddy's a longtime supporter and moderator, as you guys can tell. He's also a, an officer of the law. So, uh, yeah, he's going to be policing the chat and everything. All right, let's get back to some stories, everybody. I was a little girl, maybe four or five when this happened. This is a story about my uncle and dad, but also about my family in general. My mom's side of the family is very close, and we spend all holidays and birthdays together with my cousins, aunts, and uncles. My dad and my uncle Tim were good friends, and often watched sports together. One weekend, my dad decided to go to my uncle's house to watch some football. For a little backstory, my uncle's oldest daughter was going through a messy divorce, and her soon-to-be ex-husband, Dave, was known to be a little dark and crazy. He also didn't like my uncle Tim, as he's a bit hard to impress, and rude at times. My dad and uncle were watching the football game in my uncle's living room, when out of the front window, they noticed crazy Dave's car pull up in front of the house. Dave has no reason to come over, and they know that this isn't good. My uncle heads towards the front door, most likely expecting a confrontation, but when he gets a closer look at Dave, he notices Dave is holding a bat. Dave runs towards the door, attempting to break it down with each swing of the bat. He is unsuccessful. He then decides to go to each window of the ground level of the house, smashing all of them one by one. By the time the front living room window is shattered, my uncle yells to my dad to run, as glass smashes all over them both. They haul ass down to the basement. My uncle grabs the cordless phone before they do. Meanwhile, Dave continues to break the fence down, and then smashes the backyard sliding glass door. He enters my uncle's home. My dad and uncle huddle silently in the basement closet, as Tim calls 911. They hear Dave's footsteps, and then the kitchen being destroyed overhead. They hear Dave opening every door, yelling profanities and death promises as he searches for them. Next, 
my dad and uncle hear Dave enter the garage as he bashes in both of my dad and uncle's car's windows. Just then, they heard more footsteps, Dave running out of the house and into the front yard, then yelling, it was the police. Dave had heard the cop cars pull up, and instead of trying to run, he had decided to try to confront them. He charged at the officers, baseball bat in hand. The police immediately tased him. In Dave's car, they found rope, duct tape, and a gun. I'm not sure if Dave was on something, or if he was just so crazy that he didn't care. I think that because he hated my uncle so much, he wanted to scare and then cause him pain, rather than just using the gun. Either way, he served two years in prison. This was the craziest thing that I can think of that has happened to a family member, but what's even creepier is that my six-year-old cousin was supposed to have his birthday party at the house that day, but last minute, his mom decided to change the date. Dave knew when my cousin's birthday party was supposed to be. He knew that we all came to these family birthdays. He planned for all the uncles, aunts, and even little kids to be around when he came for revenge. Our family has never since heard from Dave, but some of my relatives have seen him in public and all avoid contact. This happened when I was 11 years old and my friend Casey was sleeping over at my house. One thing to note is that I have sleep apnea, which will usually be a bother to anybody who is sleeping over, but Casey was a very heavy sleeper. I doubt a bomb could even wake her up. At around 11 p.m., we both decided to call it a night. Another thing to note is that I have a futon leaning against my bed, so one side is against the wall and the other has a futon on it. Anyway, I remember not knowing what time it was, so I used my hand to scan the floor for my phone. When I found it, I turned it on, but the screen was so bright that I had to turn it away from my face. The light on my phone illuminated the room, and with that, I saw a tall skinny woman in her late 50s with long white hair, leaning over the bed and looking at Casey. I, of course, screamed and the woman ran. The way my house works is that my mom's room is right next to the stairs, and you had to go through my brother's room to get to the stairs. When my brother hears me screaming bloody murder, he immediately awoke to see the woman running out of my room. My mom opened her door, and my dog came rushing in front of her to attack the intruder. My dog isn't a German Shepherd, or any kind of attack dog, he is a yellow lab, but if it comes to it, he will defend us with his life. He bit the woman's ankle, and my brother pinned her down while my mom and I called the police. I woke Casey up, but we didn't leave the room. When the police finally arrived, they took her away. Later, we found out that she had a serious case of dementia. I felt bad, but at the same time, I can't describe in text or words how afraid I was for my life and Casey's life. A few days later, I was cleaning my room, and when I was moving the bed to clean under it, I found multiple food wrappers and juice boxes. I don't think I paused uh, my microphone or muted my mic, so I'm sorry for the screaming that might have came through. Angel of Toxicity says, if I don't make it back before the video ends, I'll see you all later. I uh, hope you make it back, and if not, no big deal. I appreciate you dropping in, Angel, and I'm super sorry to hear about your family. That is really some unfortunate news. I'm really sorry to hear that. And hello to everyone else who's just joining. What we're doing right now is uh, we're listening to the video that'll be coming out next since YouTube's taking its time. It would have been out already yesterday, but uh, there's some issues going on with it. So uh, we're just listening to it live together while I'm in the background playing some uh, Dead by Daylight. I don't know why the killer didn't kill me there. 
I gave him every opportunity. I was just teabagging being an idiot, but okay. It's interesting for sure. But I do appreciate everyone uh, dropping by to listen to the stories live. I am right here. I'm reading the chat as we go. I'm not pausing the stories to say hello to every person that comes in because that was kind of ruining the stories. But I will be, will be uh, pausing it after every couple of stories to say what's up to everybody. This game is Dead by Daylight. It's essentially uh, like a survival game. As right now, I'm a survivor. That's what Jesus. Everyone calls this guy Jesus because he looks like Jesus. But uh, survivors fix generators and then open a door and try to leave. And uh, there's different killers that'll try to see him. As you just saw in the last one, that was Freddy Krueger. There's uh, Michael Myers. Uh, there's quite a few different killers. Um, Leatherface, all that kind of stuff. So if you're a killer, you try to kill everyone. If you're a survivor, you try to get the generators and get out before the killer kills you. That killer, for some reason, just uh, wasn't killing me. All I had to do was teabag in front of him, and he went after other people. I don't know why, but works for me. Hex says, it's night in India. Oh, yeah, what's going on, India? Yeah, it's Arizona. It's only noon here on the desert. Well, I guess India might have deserts as well. Hmm. Melv Niasia, appreciate you dropping in. Charlotte, good to see you again. Glad you made the stream. Rachel says, holy blood points. This is low blood points. I just spent like 400,000 blood points on Jesus trying to upgrade. I only bought him to get a... Well, I bought him with the shards I earned. I didn't actually pay for him. I just worked for him. But uh, I got him only for his perks. So I'm just trying to unlock his perks. And then I'll go back to using like Nia or something like that. I don't know. All right, let's get back into some stories. Oh, let me remember to mute my microphone this time. The story I'm about to tell is something that happened over the course of a few years, and I can't confirm that it even stopped happening. I live in Langley, a town near Vancouver. Half of Langley has the lowest crime in the Lower Mainland, while the other half has one of the highest crime rates. I live in the low crime rate end but my brother lives in the high crime rate end. I'm a pretty lanky kid, who's a lot shorter than my brother, and my brother is pretty muscly and tall. This all started a few years ago, when my brother moved into the bad side of town. I didn't move with him, but sometimes I would visit. One weekend he introduced me to one of his new friends, Jonathan. Jonathan was a bit weird, but we had some fun. Jonathan had a few friends of his own that he would bring over, and they were fun too. Though, after a while they started to get really weird. For example, Jonathan stopped using the bathroom, and would just let loose a log while he was wrestling on the trampoline. Shit particles would be everywhere. It was so unavoidable that I just stopped hanging out with them. They were so fucking disgusting. Every week they would beg me to hang out with them and I would just say I'm busy, or that I was going to make something to eat to avoid the situation. This went on for a little while, and by a little while, I mean about a year. After that year passed, Jonathan moved out, and we never heard anything from him again. This was a big relief to all of us, because he actually started to do really messed up shit, like watch my mom get changed, or worse. There were times he would bang on the window when I'm taking a piss and scare the shit out of me. Sometimes he would just straight up terrify me as I saw his face staring at me through the living room window when I was trying to sleep on the couch. So it was pretty grand that he moved. A few weeks went by and it felt like he was never there in the first place. But after those weeks, his friends started coming back and my brother became friends with them again. This upset me because they would get into fights all the time, over the stupidest things, like Call of Duty or Left 4 Dead. Some weeks, I just wouldn't visit him because I had had enough. Some weeks I wouldn't visit him because his friends had had enough of me. For whatever reasons, I'm still not very sure. This went on for a year, and it was so fucking annoying because they would always get into fights. After that year passed, things really started to hit rock bottom. 
my brother got a new girlfriend named Lexi. She was fine, and I didn't have a problem. It's just that the level of drama got so intense that I decided to stop coming. Though some weeks I would still come by, being persuaded by my brother. Every time I came over, they would be fighting over new things. For example, someone cheating on someone, and more stupid things like that. A few weeks later, I went to my brother's house, and one of his friends actually tried to run us over with his car. We were crossing the street to get some junk food, and we didn't even know he was coming. We were okay, but we were startled, and we were on full-on adrenaline. We got what we wanted, and sprinted back home. My mom got an earful that night. She didn't really care, and told us to watch some TV or something. So we did. Every few minutes we would hear rustling in the bushes though, but no one broke in or looked through the windows, so we never figured out who it was. Fast forward two weeks. I'm walking home from school, and another guy with a car tries to run me over, but I move fast enough for him to drive past me. There was heavy traffic, so he didn't try to hit me again. The weird part about this is that there was no way he would have known where I lived because my brother and I live in opposite parts of town. Fast forward about three months and my mom makes a post on Facebook about something that happened to my brother. The post she made said that he hadn't come home for two days and that she was freaking out. A few hours later, she called my house telling me that he was found unconscious and robbed of everything with him and in an entirely different town. That freaked me out, but it got worse. When my brother and mom were sleeping in their house, people broke in and stole a bunch of expensive items, like my mom's new laptop and some of my brother's games. They tried their hardest to get their stuff back, but the police said they couldn't do anything, and they went about their lives. Last month, my brother witnessed a girl coming into his house and stealing someone's phone. The girl got away, but luckily, he knew who she was and knew how to get into her Facebook, for some reason I really don't know. He was able to open her messenger, and she was talking to some unknown guy on Facebook. She was trying to sell the phone to some drug dealer to get crack. So he called the police and told them where the deal was being made, and she was arrested for theft. After that, again, no word so I'm guessing it's been fine. I'm only interested in bringing all of this up because of what happened last night when I was on my computer. I was just doing my usual scrolling through Facebook, liking the occasional good meme, and groaning over every here comes dat boy meme. You know, the usual boring evening. No one was awake but me. I was getting too bored, so I started listening to some YouTube. I'm afraid of being alone, to an extent, but I got used to it, so I was not really afraid. It's about an hour later, and I have nothing to do, so I start scrolling over my social media again, trying to find a good laugh. Suddenly, I get this heart-wrenching feeling like I'm being watched. I look around, and there's no one there, and I'm on the second floor, so no one could just be looking through my window, and even though I'm in my living room, I'm far enough away from any window where anyone could see me. I conclude I'm just getting anxious, so I watch some Dawes games to chill the mood up a bit. When out of nowhere, this black figure appears in my peripheral vision. I thought that it was my grandfather for a second, but it just stood there. The feeling of being watched came back, and I was too afraid to look. Whoever it was ran into my kitchen at full speed. At this point I looked. I had to. The person then ran full pace down the stairs and outside. I was completely beside myself. A bunch of hints suddenly clicked in. For example, things I was sure that I placed in one spot would be in an entirely different spot when I went to go find them. Boxes would be on their side and the vacuum cleaner was taken out of the closet. I knew that all of my brother's friends liked to mess with me, but I don't know if it was them. I really don't understand what they were doing, because nothing was stolen. It just seems kind of pointless to hide in someone's house just to move a few items around. 
I really hope they don't come back. I'm not looking forward to an encore. This happened to me about 25 years ago, and it is still as vivid to me today as it was 25 years ago. But let me give you some perspective beforehand. I'm 36 years old, have my bachelor's degree, was in the military, and am an atheist. So, there's very little room in my life for things that I do believe in, or things that I do not believe in. I am not the type of person who scares easily. Even growing up, I was never afraid of the dark, or the boogeyman. I grew up in an extremely small town on the southwestern edge of Michigan, a tiny resort called South Haven. My family wasn't wealthy, but we weren't poor either. My dad made a good living as a general contractor. Being that he was in construction, I learned a lot about our house, even if I didn't want to. One of the things about our house that was very odd was that it only had one door to enter or exit and one bathroom that happened to be right by our front door and across the hallway from my room. These are the key elements to this story. I was 10 or 11 at the time this happened. One night I wake up to the sound of someone walking down our hall. The footfall sounded heavy, like it was most likely my dad. So without thinking about it twice, I rolled over and fell back asleep. When I wake the next morning, I am waiting to use the bathroom when my brother comes out and tells me to make sure to flush the toilet after you use it during the night. Not sure what he meant. I tell him that I didn't use the bathroom last night. Dad did. But to mine and my brother's dismay, he tells us that he didn't use the bathroom at all last night. Well, with what I remember hearing and what was in the toilet, someone did use our bathroom. Over the course of the next few nights, there are several occurrences where the same thing happens. I am awoke into the sound of heavy footfalls, and there is always bright yellow pee in the toilet in the morning. However, the only thing that hasn't been connected yet is that the footsteps only go to the bathroom. I never hear anyone go in, or use the bathroom for that matter. After a solid month of this occurrence, I decide to try and figure it out. When I head to bed that night, I leave my door open just enough to let the light and shadows in. Just like clockwork, I woke up to heavy footsteps. The door is open enough for me to make out a form coming down the hallway. However, when it gets to my door, oddly enough my door is pulled shut. I am completely scared shitless now. Someone or something just closed my door. I, just like any kid, throw the covers over my head and try to hide away from this fright. Now at this point, I tell my family what's been happening. My dad was raised in our house. The room I live in was the room of my grandma and grandpa. They both had been dead for years prior to these instances. My dad jokingly tells me that when he was a kid, he had the same thing happen to him as well. Being that my dad is a big joker, I didn't believe him, but he did say that he was never able to see anything. I told him what had happened with the closing of my door. He again said that he had never seen anything like that happen. I have a strange sense of fear slash wonder. I almost feel like I need to try to see whatever this thing looks like. So I decide that the next time this happens, I'm going to get out of bed, go to my door, open it, turn on the lights, which will illuminate the bathroom. Now, keep in mind, up until this point I have only ever seen a shadow or heard things. Besides the leftover pee, Never anything else besides the shadow that closed my door. That night I lay awake for a while. Finally I fall asleep, only to be jolted awake by the sounds of those familiar footfalls. For some reason I have much more fear running through me. I could almost see my fear like lightning in the air. I throw my covers off as quietly as I can, sit up and swing my feet off my bed. I start to walk towards my door and light switch, when my door seems to be pulled shut. While that happens, I'm startled to hear the sound of pee in the toilet. Now of course, realizing that it's probably my dad pranking me the whole time, I don't bother to turn off my bedroom light. However, the second I put my hand on my bedroom door, the pee stops. I step into the hallway, 
only to see that the bathroom door is closed and the light is off. I figure it's all or nothing at this point. I rush into the bathroom to find a very odd scene. The toilet is filled with yellow pee, and there are two distinct footprints remaining in the carpet in front of the toilet. I guess carpet in the bathroom was a Midwest thing, but without it I wouldn't have had anything besides the pee to show anyone. I run to my parents' room and get my dad. I tell him what happened, and he tells me that I was probably sleepwalking and dreaming while I was doing it, and peed in the toilet myself. After this incident, there were two other times where the same thing happened. The very last time it happened was the most odd. All of the same things happened. The foot falls, pulls my door shut, but when I make it into the bathroom, the water in the sink was on, and from the mist of hot water, there was a strange fog on the mirror, but there was a handprint on it. After that, I made my brother switch me rooms. I appreciate everyone dropping in the stream. What's up, everybody? I see you, Greg. Andrew. Yeah, that was a good spirit right there. I'll tell you what. I mean, I'm not the, really the greatest, but... At least I was getting some work done. I got some points. Most out of our team so far. That dude got zero points. Oh, he disconnected. That was that guy I saved. What a waste, too. I went and saved him, and he disconnected. I thought it might have been the guy on the ground that disconnected. Otherwise, I went and, went and revived him. So, Eh, it is what it is. Not too shabby. Yeah, Spirit's a really hard killer. Huntress, I'd rather go against Huntress than Spirit. Spirit and Legion are the two that I don't want to go against. Doctor would be great, because I have a build that would counter the Doctor. So yeah, for those of you that are just dropping in, we're listening to some stories. This will be the next video that comes out. Um, YouTube's just having some issues monetizing it, because they're fucking weird. But uh, it should hopefully go up here soon. and. Uh, Probably tomorrow or something like that. So these are the stories you're hearing right now. Uh, what we'll do after this is probably put on some stories that are unlisted for years type of thing. I'll find some of my old videos, old, old videos. Still some really good stories, but you'll be able to hear where I came from narration-wise. Uh, how it came uh, to be. All that good stuff. You'll be able to hear how cringeworthy it is and all that good stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm right here. I'm actually live with y'all. I'm reading all the comments. Uh, Replying with I can't. I'm actually playing live this video game in the background. This is Dead by Daylight. And I play on PlayStation 4. And, uh, yeah. So, we're just doing this. Got the live background of a video game going. Listening to some stories with y'all. I'm reading chat. Trying to say what's up when I can when I'm typing. When I'm not dying on a hook type of thing. So. Good to see a whole bunch of people joining in here. And I appreciate all the new subscribers. I see a few of you. Subscribing, whether it be from a live stream or a video, I have no idea, but I appreciate you. For those of you listening, if you're enjoying this stream, make sure you hit the like button. I'd like to do a lot more like this, but uh, let me know down below if you actually like it. If you like it, hit the like. If you don't like it, hit the like. <laughs> yeah, that's how we do it around here. All right, everybody, let's get back to some stories, and uh, that's pretty much what's going on. I see uh, you, me, tube. What up, dude? Rachel, yeah, Legion is a pain in the booty. Sure. All right, let's get back into these stories. My name is Michael, and a few months ago I was spending the night at my friend Trevor's house. He is not really an outdoorsy kind of guy, but I had convinced him to walk through a huge field next to his house and into the woods to explore. I should probably tell you about us before I continue. I was 15 at the time, 195 pounds and 5 foot 4. Not really muscular, more on the fat side. Trevor is the opposite, about 6 foot 3, maybe 160 pounds, like a twig. Anyways, we were walking up through the woods and we found a trail at the top of the hill, more like a steep slope. We decided to follow it for a while, about 20 minutes or so, when it started getting dark outside. I only had an iPod 4 at the time, and his phone was on a low battery, so when we decided to head home, 
we had to turn the flashlight on his phone on and off. It took us a while, but we finally made it to the bottom of the hill, when we see that we had went the wrong way. We came out on the highway, next to a state farm building. He told me he knew where we were, and said to follow him down the road, which I did. About ten minutes later we turned left, onto a thin road going through some thick woods, with only about three or four houses spaced out. He told me that there was a kidnapping somewhere on this street, and that back when his mother was our age, there was a rapist who lived in one of these houses. We were both really tired, because we had been walking for nearly two hours down this skinny street, when he turned and pointed to the supposed rapist's house. It looked more like a shack, with a cracked roof, overgrown grass, that sort of stuff. We were being quiet walking past it, when all of a sudden some dogs started barking and growling. I'm pretty sure at us. We started to pick up pace, when we heard a door open and slam shut, and then some old sounding man yelling, Come out kids, I know you're here. With that, we bolted in the other direction, back the wrong way. Once we had caught our breath, we decided to pass the house through the woods. It seemed like a good idea, but definitely wasn't. A little ways past the house, we heard leaves crunching behind us, and then growling. It was the man, who seemed to be in his late fifties, if I had to guess. He had followed us, and brought his dogs with him. At this point, I was cursing at myself in my head for being so dumb, and Trevor was murmuring some nonsensical words. Without warning, the man had let go of his dogs, and we ran through the woods, with those damn dogs at our heels. One of them ripped my jacket, and I tripped, but got back up. Eventually, we started to see his neighborhood to the right, and we swerved out of the woods and jumped over some fences and into someone's backyard. The dog bit Trevor's leg, but we got away. They were going crazy on the other side, but the man was nowhere to be seen. I guess he couldn't keep up with how old he was. We waited for what seemed like an hour before they ran off after something. We sat there for maybe five more minutes before hopping back over the fence and running to his house. We got inside and locked the doors, which freaked his mom out. We told her what happened to us, and she, surprisingly, wasn't mad. She sort of chuckled and told us how happy she was that we were okay. Well, other than the dog bite on Trevor's leg, which wasn't bad. She said she wanted to call the cops, but we convinced her not to. We were way too afraid and just wanted to not think about it. We haven't gone back into the woods anymore for fear of getting lost again. I'm really glad we got away from that guy. It was frightening just thinking about what might have happened to us. I'm a reenactor by hobby, and I'm part of a group. As well as public events, we sometimes get together for private training days. We cover stuff like weapons and tactics used during World War II, amongst other things. One site we used was a national trust site, Spring Hill House. The property covers many acres, and at the far back of the site, there is a foundation that belongs to Nissan huts that were used to house the 505th PIR 82nd Airborne during the war. Although most of it is overgrown now and heavily wooded, there is a trail that loops round from the back of the house and brings you back almost to the same point. At this site, we usually had our event over the weekend, which meant spending the Saturday night in a barn that we were allowed to stay in. We loved it, as that means a bit of crack in the morning. It also gives us the opportunity to conduct night ops when it becomes dark, which we did on this night. On the Saturday, six group members showed up, with the rest showing up Sunday. Nighttime came, and so did the time for the night ops. Since there were so few of us, we decided that two of the German reenactors would be out on patrol, with the four allies leaving in two groups of two, a few minutes apart, in hopes to engage the enemy. Myself and my friend, Tom, were patrolling the trail round back to the house, listening for any movement other than our own. 
it was completely silent, as we were miles away from the nearest town. We reached the farthest point from the house. Suddenly we hear the rustling of leaves and snapping of twigs to our right. We dropped to our knees and took cover behind a tree, as soldiers do, and gave our allies a call sign. There is no response. We give the all section call sign. No response. The noise was a little way off the trail in the scrub. There was a gap in the trees big enough to let the moonlight through. I could see we were facing where the once overgrown Nissan huts once stood. The noise was coming from behind them. I could just make out a tall, thin, black shadow figure moving between the trees. I'm sure it wasn't a human, as it moved from left to right for a short distance, and then seemed to repeat this. I watched this figure do this three times before Tom turned to me and whispered, Do you see that? Yeah, I replied. Let's get out of here. We hurried it back to the lights of the barn, where we found the four other members had returned due to the 12 a.m. finish time for the exercise. We were slightly freaked out, but it didn't really bother us. In fact, we weren't even sure what we had seen. It wasn't until one of the guys playing the Germans said that he had seen something similar in the same place that night, too. I was glad to have two other people that had seen it, as it confirms that there was something there. Although, I'm still not entirely sure what. I have often wondered why the figure repeated the same action, again and again. As I said, the figure walked from left to right a few steps, then walked from left to right again. It wasn't a line of people, otherwise we would have heard them and seen them. Only three of my group ventured that far, including me, and we didn't stray off the trail. And the figure didn't venture past the two trees I was using as markers whilst watching its movements. I couldn't work it out, until I came across an article about the stone tape theory. The stone tape theory is the speculation that ghosts and hauntings are analogous to tape recordings, and that electrical mental impressions released during emotional and traumatic events can somehow be stored in moist rocks and other items, and replayed under certain conditions. I was visiting my half-brother and his family in Harlan, Kentucky, the kind of place you don't find on a map. Typical Deep South good old boys. They had a huge property. In front, there were non-operating train tracks that, when followed, went to this old basketball court slash shooting range area. Both sides of the tracks to get there had thick brush, barbed wire fence like a max security prison, and a 30-foot deadly rocky drop on either side meaning when you walk the tracks, you were safe and can't fall, unless you cut your body in half to get through the sharp fence and brush. I was 22 at the time, and just got my new Glock 26 handgun, and my 14-year-old cousin was begging to go down to the tracks and shoot it. It was 4 p.m. and winter, so it got dark at around 6.30 p.m., and the track walk to the basketball area that we made into a hillbilly gun range was only a quarter mile walk, if that. I had 200 9mm rounds, so I figured that would do, beside the 10 round hollow point magazine I kept for defense. We went down the tracks, keep in mind this was our private property, and the neighbors were family on both sides of the tracks, so we had the area to us and family without any worries. After 200 rounds were fired off, it was already almost dark. The walk back at night sucked because there was only one light on the tracks to show the halfway point from the range to the house that my half-brother's dad installed. As we were walking, we saw a dark shadow sitting on the tracks, which was not normal. It was a man, with a cowboy hat on, and what seemed to be a long coat. We couldn't see his face. I asked him if he was okay, but he just stayed still. I told him he was on private property, and needed to leave nothing. Again, I told him he needed to leave. He was frozen like a statue. I pulled my gun, which already had my hollow point magazine in it, and pointed at him yelling, get the fuck up now. 
I noticed my cousin took off running after an odd scream he let out, for no reason other than a possible shootout. But for some reason, I took off running too, only to glance back and see nothing. What the fuck? You can't jump as I said, and even if he tried I would have heard it, and it would take 20 minutes to get through the razor wires. We ran home and told my cousin's dad what happened. He laughed with an odd look, told my cousin to relax and not to worry. He called me into the next room and said, I saw him once too, and then brought me into his office area, opening a door saying, read this. It was a newspaper article, dated 1950 or something, during the coal mining wars of Harlan, Kentucky. Just search for the book called Bloody Harlan. Yup, my half-brother's family's in it. Anyway, the article said, Man commits suicide on train tracks, but assumed murder. The photo was of the same man that I almost shot. What's up, everybody? Uh, let me mute this. So yeah, that was uh, the next video that's going to be coming out. I don't know how many of you actually heard it all the way through. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. this is actually me playing in the background as you see me dying. I kind of sacrificed myself for my team, but that's cool. I'm not too worried about it. That's why I'm going in with nothing, is that way I can kill myself and not really worry about it. I don't really care. Oh, I didn't. I was still pressing the button. Okay, anyways. So yeah, what we're going to do now is I got a video. <laughs> this is an old video, this next one. This is uh, from July 27th, 2015. So it's one of my earlier videos. You'll be able to hear how, how far I've come. I think at this point I was recording on my cell phone, I think. And I was still using a computer that was running Vista and I had one gig of RAM. Like it was crazy doing all that. But you were able to hear all the difference, uh, you know, how far the channels come, all that kind of stuff. But I figured it'd be fun to go through some of the older ones as well as not only the one that'll be released next to you guys, but here's some uh, where I came from type of thing. So this next video is going to be kind of cringeworthy, but uh, it'll show the progress in the channel, I guess you could say. Still some good stories. I do miss some of the stories from back then. They had some really good ones. I should re-narrate them. But a lot of these videos are unlisted. You're not going to find them unless you're a patron. If you're a patron, one of the perks is to get all of my unlisted videos. So you get like 24 hours of content. So if you are interested in supporting the channel, uh, patron would be the best way. There's different perks for different tiers. But uh, you'd be able to find this video through the $5 tier. But there's, like I said over 24 hours worth of content that you're not going to find on the channel unless you're a patron type of thing. So this is one of those videos. Hope you uh, enjoy. The following are true scary stories. God, it's so Found on the subreddit, weird. let's not meet. It's so old. I'll have a link in the description below to each of the stories if you'd like to read along. I used to intro every enjoy video, this video like that. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe so you can catch my future videos. That was every video intro. Let's begin. So before I tell my story, let me set the scene. This all happened to me a few years ago. I'm an average looking girl, and at the time I was in my early 20s. I'm fair skinned, and back then I had long, wavy, dark brown hair. Maybe I was pretty if you squinted. I'm just above average height for a girl, and have a pretty average build. This stuff isn't that important. At least not yet. It was Christmas time, and I was coming home from work. I hate working during the Christmas season. Being in customer service is the absolute worst because no matter what happens, it's always your fault. I had just worked for the last 10 days straight and was looking forward to the next day because I was off, which was why I wanted to get home so badly. At my place of employment, we wear Santa hats in addition to our regular uniform for some festive cheer. Normally I take my hat off when I'm on my way home, but on this day, I was feeling lazy. 
I'm not sure if the hat had anything to do with what happened, but maybe it did. I take public transportation to and from work because I don't have a car and parking is super expensive. I was waiting at the train station, looking at my phone, when a middle-aged, Middle Eastern man approaches me. Hello, he said. He had a very heavy accent. I glanced up from my phone. I didn't really want to talk to anyone. I had spent the last several days doing nothing but being around people. And honestly, I had had enough of it. All I wanted to do was be a hermit and drink a bottle of wine or two. But for some reason, I responded, Hi. I like your hat. Thanks. I looked back at my phone. I could still feel the man's eyes on me, but decided to ignore it. Hopefully, he would get the hint and move on. It's not that uncommon to say hello to people at the station, so I didn't think that much of it. I could still feel his eyes on me though, which was why I was so grateful when the train finally came. I got on and moved to one of the cars in the back, as they usually have more room. As soon as I sit down though, the man appears in front of me. Can I sit? He indicated to the seat next to me. Okay. I should have said no, but I was tired. I didn't have any energy left in me to argue about anything. I then returned my gaze back down to my phone. My creepo meter hadn't been hit at this point, but I was a little uncomfortable. I'm a big fan of personal space, especially since you don't get that when you have a customer service job. Still, I only have about a 25 minute ride, so I thought I could deal with it. Besides, he might get off before me, and then I'd have my space again. What did you do today? He was looking at me again. I worked. Oh, where do you work? Why do people always think that they can ask strangers this? I only half glanced at him and gave him the name of a grocery store I had worked at a few years ago. I wasn't creeped out, but it wasn't any of his business. Good, good. What is your name? Sarah. Sarah isn't my name. I honestly don't even know why I said that. Sarah is the name of someone I work with, and for some reason her name spilled out before I could even think about it. I'll spare you the rest of the details about our conversation, most of it. He asked me a lot of personal questions, like how long I had worked there, what I did in my free time, was I married, did I have a boyfriend, and so on. The more questions he asked, the more uncomfortable I began to feel. So I lied. I told him I was engaged to someone named Tom, and I wanted to work in a live theater. I probably should have said something more boring, because he seemed to like my answers. We should be friends, he says suddenly. I'm from Iran. That's not the bad one. I'm not bad. I tend to overthink things, so I'm running through different scenarios in my head. Maybe he was harmless and just lonely. Maybe he had just moved here and was having problems with racism. Or, maybe he had something more sinister in mind. Okay. I said, because what else could I say? Do you have friends? They can be my friends too. Do you like coffee? We should go have coffee. Throughout most of the conversation, his tone had been pleasant enough but there was still something about the way he said it that I didn't like. We talked a bit more and he kept saying we needed to be friends and that we should meet up. Then he began to ask me more personal questions, like how far I had gone with Tom and where was Tom. Then he began to talk about how I looked. Now my creepo meter was starting to ping. What station do you get off? I get off at Le. My stomach dropped. That was the stop after mine. I didn't really want to spend any more time with this man than I already had. Besides, for some reason, I just knew him knowing my train stop would be bad news. The next one, actually. I said, and began to gather my things. It was nice to meet you. 
I pushed past him and headed for the door, grateful we were just about to stop at the station. I got off the train and didn't look back. I even headed down the stairs just in case he was looking out the window to make it look like I was really leaving. I was halfway down the stairs when I heard the train leave again, so I turned around to go back up. There he was. He was glaring at me. And while he might have looked harmless before, he didn't now. For a moment, all I could do was stare at him. Then I realized it looked like he was holding something in one of his hands. I didn't get a chance to see what it really was, and I don't think I want to know. I finally turned around and ran. I could hear him behind me. I have never heard footsteps so loud before. At this point, I probably should have called the police or maybe even started screaming. But all I could think about was getting out of that station, which was mostly empty. Honestly, I had probably picked the wrong station to get off at. There isn't much around this one, other than a few industrial places, and at this time of night, they probably wouldn't have been open. Someone must have been looking out for me though, because just as I get to the entrance of the station, I see two police officers getting into their car. I shout out to the officers. Hey! The officers looked up at me, and I sprinted over to them. The combination of stopping suddenly and the fear that had spiked through me must have given me vertigo, because one of the officers had to catch me as I got to them. Somehow, I managed to get out what had just happened. The officer who had caught me just stayed with me while the other went to find the man. He must have seen the cops and taken the exit towards the parking lot because he was nowhere to be found. The officers were very nice. They said I had good intuition and was smart for not giving him any of my other information. Then they took me home. It wasn't until several months later that I found out the man was part of a sex trafficking ring. He had come to my city to kidnap young women and take them to various parts of the Middle East and Europe to sell them into sex slavery. Apparently, he had gone after several other girls that looked like I did, pale with dark brown hair. As far as I know, this man was never successful and was eventually caught. I found out he had had a syringe in his hand and it was a drug he had planned on using to knock his victims out. I don't know how he planned on getting me to wherever it was he was hauled up, and that's another detail I don't want to know either. I also don't know what I would have done if the police officers hadn't been there. I hope I would have been able to fight him off, or get somewhere I could call for help. The one thing I do know? Sex trafficker on the train? Let's not meet. I spent the past six months studying abroad in Brisbane, Australia. Of course, studying abroad requires little actual studying and a lot of traveling. In June, one of my housemates and I decided to spend the week in Australia since our exams were over sooner than we anticipated. We had separate flights back to Brisbane because his tickets were much more expensive than mine. He would be leaving at noon and I would be leaving at 6 a.m. I quickly discovered the reason that my tickets were cheaper, and that was because it was hard to get to the airport at that hour. I would need to be at the airport by 5 to check in, and the only way to do so, besides a cab which is really expensive, would be to catch the 4 a.m. train from the museum station. I decided my best option would be to leave my hostel around midnight when people are still partying and whatnot, as opposed to leaving at a more dodgy hour like 3, and I would spend a few hours at the train station, where I assumed I would be safe. I left my hostel by myself at midnight. It was freezing cold, winter on Australia, as well as pouring down rain. My smartphone from home was broken, and my new one had yet to arrive, so all I had was a cheap, prepaid Australian phone. This means no GPS, so I had to rely on a literal map for directions. As soon as I stepped outside of my hostel, my map becomes pretty much drenched by the rain. 
I am clearly lost, trying to examine it and pacing around outside of my hostel. A man who doesn't look too much older than myself, I am 20, approaches me. He is wearing a work uniform, a hat and a shirt from a pizza place. He asks me if I'm looking for something and tells me that I look lost, and I tell him that I'm looking for the museum station. He points into the distance. Well, it's over that way, but if you want, I can drive you. I'm a pizza delivery driver and I'm working right now, but I'll pass the museum station anyways. I hesitate for a second, but I decide it might be more reliable than me getting lost in the rain and missing my flight and everything. Plus, since I know where he works from his uniform, I decide he's trustworthy. I ask him his name and where he works before I accept his offer. I learn his name and that he's 24 years old, from Nepal, and works at some fancy pizza place in Kings Cross, Sydney that I've since forgotten the name of. I accept his offer and follow him to his car. In the passenger seat is one of those pizza box carrying cases and the car smells of pizza, so I trust the fact that he's working. While he is driving around, we are making small talk. I tell him my flight to Brisbane is at 6 and the train is at 4. He tells me that the train station is not a safe place to wait by myself at those hours, and that if I'd be willing to wait until he finishes his shift, he would drive me all the way to the airport. The airport is a little ways outside of the city. I gratefully accept, but I have to wait until around 1.30. The car is warm and I am grateful for the guy's offer, so I don't mind. I just sit in his car while he drives back and forth between the pizza place and different residences. Finally, his shift is over, so he drives back to the pizza place to clock out or whatever. He comes back to the car and he brings me a huge pizza and a bottle of coke for free. This is for you. If you want water or a jacket or anything, I can give you that. Just let me know. I thank him and start eating the pizza while he begins to drive to the airport. It's all going fine and well until suddenly it does a total 180. How long have you been in Sydney? A week. Well, have you had sex with anyone in Sydney? I am so alarmed that I am speechless. You should, because you'll remember the city forever. No, I am okay with buying souvenirs and taking pictures of the landscape. I try and keep it casual. Do you have a boyfriend? No. I realized this was dumb, and I should have said yes, probably. But oh well. Hindsight is twenty twenty. You need a hot partner with a hot body to keep warm in this weather. You're cute, so I bet you have a hot body under those clothes. I'm a pretty awkward person, and I have no idea what to say. So instead I just eat my pizza, so I have an excuse not to talk. Then, he puts his hand on the back of my head and starts massaging my hair. I eat my pizza and don't react. His hand moves to my face and begins tracing the line of my jaw as I chew my pizza. And then his fingers move to my lips, which he traces as well, and sticks his finger in my mouth as I try and chew my pizza. I'm eating a pizza you got me. So he withdraws his hand. Then there's a red light, and he stops. When he stops, he turns to me and demands, Kiss me. I'm eating. I say with a mouthful of pizza. I'll wait. So obviously, I take as long as possible to chew my food. Thankfully, the light turns green, so he turns his attention back to driving. On the way to the airport, there are always heaps of signs pointing to the airport. So I watch the signs, waiting for the moment where there is a fork in the road. Airport, this way. Middle of nowhere, Australia? This way. But he's following all of the airport signs. I guess it is obvious that I'm watching the signs because he says, What, you don't trust me? I can't say no, obviously, because I'm in the car with him and his stuff. So I tell him of course I trust him. It's nowhere near five. Would you rather come to my house and wait there so you don't have to wait alone at the airport? No thanks, I don't want to risk missing my flight. 
He keeps asking and telling me that he wants to keep me warm there, and I keep saying no. Finally, at about 2 a.m., we get to the airport domestic terminal. He pulls up to let me out, and as I'm gathering my bags, he slams his arm across my chest. Wait. I want you to kiss me. No, thank you. Then he proceeds to beg me more and more to come to his house. I keep saying no with the excuse that I don't want to miss my flight. Then he offers instead that we can pull the car up the road from the airport and wait inside there, and he even said he would let me take a nap. I tell him no again. Finally, I decide to bargain with him, and I say I'll give him my number so if he's ever in Brisbane, we will hang out. Of course, I won't do that, but I have to bargain my way out of this situation somehow because he won't listen to my constant no's. I give him my Australian phone number, and he says he'll text me his name so I have his number too. He sent the message, and I guess my phone was on silent, because he said, I didn't hear your phone ring. Show me it so I know that you got the... Well, I actually gave him the right number, so I show him the text, and he tells me bye, and that he looks forward to seeing me in Brisbane. I gather my things and get out of the car, happy to finally be at the airport. The guy drives away, but he stops at the curb and is just sitting there, watching me. No matter, I think. I'll be safe inside the airport. The airport has all of its lights on and everything seems to be running. But I go to open the door and... It's locked. I check a nearby sign. The airport opens at 4 a.m. It's only just past 2 now. This guy is watching me from the curb and there is no one else around. Panicking, I walk the opposite way. Thankfully, I see a man who is clearly waiting to get inside the airport as well, since he has bags and whatnot. I tell him about the creeper and ask if I can sit with him and wait for the airport to open. He turns out to be a very nice, older Australian guy, and he tells me about his girlfriend that is going to meet him at the airport at 6, and about the new boat they had just recently bought for their home at the Gold Coast. He has a bottle of ginger wine, and he suggests we split it and watch a documentary about Vikings on his iPad while we wait for the airport to open. The entire time, the pizza guy was parked at the curb, just watching me. Until 4 a.m., when people started arriving and the airport opened, that's when he finally drove away. Over the next few days, I got texts from him saying that he misses me and it was lovely meeting me and all his texts were signed kisses. I never replied. I even got a few calls from him that I left unanswered. And that's the end of that story. Teddy, good you made it back. Glad you had a nice lunch with your husband. Good to hear, my dude. For those of you that don't know, yeah, that was a really old video. Really old. That was from 2015. That was back when I recorded on my cell phone. And uh, back before my wife had braces, so she would do uh, the female voices when she could. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really cool to hear the old school stories, and I remember some of the lines so much. Like as soon as a couple lines like are read, I'm just like, damn, I remember those. It's crazy. So it's uh, it's fun to listen to these old ones with you guys too. So you guys can hear it as well. This is uh. From the very second video is when I actually started using that separation sound. Because I remember after my very first video, some... Because my very first video was really bad. Really bad. The music was loud as hell. You couldn't tell when the stories ended and another one began. Type of thing. So someone's like, I can't tell when the stories begin and end. That's where that original sound in between my stories came from. Is on my second video I figured out a sound and that's been the same sound from the beginning. And my very first video is when I came up with the It's Always Scarier If It's True. That was just like a random thing I said at the end of the video and uh, happened to do well. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear a lot of my older stories. I hope you all find them as interesting as I do. And for those of you wondering, the background is uh, Dead by Daylight. It's a video game. But, uh... The stories are 
older one. I got a lot of older stories. I, I, I have like over 24 hours of unlisted stories that my, uh, one of my patron perks actually gives you access to all of them. But we're going through some of them right now. I'm trying to find another one we'll go and listen to. Man, it's just, it's so, so nostalgic for me to go through a lot of these older videos. Like, I'm looking back in 2015. It's just crazy. This one's unlisted. It's got, uh, 200,000 views on this one video. This one's from, uh, July 24th, 2015. Like, it's just crazy looking at my old videos. And all these are unlisted, too. This was back when I numbered, just put true scary stories and then just numbered them. I didn't even put anything else in the titles or anything. We'll go ahead and put this one. This was, this was my true scary stories number eight. And it was uploaded on July 3rd, 2015. This was like right around the time my channel started. For scary stories like my very first video of scary stories I see it right here two scary stories number one June 24th 2015 so this other one was literally like a month a little under a month because I, I used to post so much back then it was because we could just grab the store well we couldn't have we just did we just grabbed the stories and go but yeah it's super crazy Floral says, ah, what a gift. I'm in my last class of school, and I'm very happy to be able to listen to you. Thanks for helping me get through the, my day. I'm glad I can help you get through your day and pass time a little bit quicker. Listening to these older stories, as well as the ones that will be up tomorrow. These other ones that are going up, that was like up today and yesterday, are actually stories that went from my, uh, my second channel, Fear Your Maker. Once YouTube went with some crazy issues with that. I ended up, uh, I'm just gonna merge the channel, so I'm transferring the stories over. So, yeah. Gustav says, working on a 500 word essay due tomorrow. Thanks for helping me stay focused. I'm glad I can help, dude. Essays, once you get into them, are actually really easy to do. It's just the matter of actually getting into them. But for me, like, once I get into writing, it's just next thing I know, hours have gone by and I got pages written of stuff. Yeah, even like a, a collaboration I did with Crypt TV. They asked me to write a story. I think it was like 20 minutes long or something like that. And next thing I know, it's like 50 minutes long, and I got to try to cut scenes out of it so it actually fits their time frame. So glad I can help out, man. Have I ever shared a personal scary story? Yes, I've shared a few of them throughout my videos and in live streams. Um, I can't exactly... Actually, my very first one, I shared one of me being almost kidnapped. Not in very much detail, because I was just, like, throwing it in there type of thing. But, uh, I've shared a few of them at the end of some of my videos and whatnot. So. Aaron says, you know that Wolf Creek movie is a true story. I've never even heard of that movie, so it doesn't change my perspective on it at all. Mm-hmm. What up, Rosario? I appreciate you dropping in. Uh, it's more or less I'm listening live. I've read a story live, but uh, a lot of these are, like, we listen to almost an hour's worth of paranormal stories that'll be going on the vid channel next, and now we're listening to some really old videos that are unlisted, and the only people that usually have access are my patrons, but I'm gonna go ahead and listen to some on stream with y'all. You all can hear him. Yeah. So, uh... Yeah, the last video, you all got to hear my wife help me out. And then in, uh... I don't even remember this video. I remember this thumbnail. And I'm sure once the stories go, I'll start remembering. It's so crazy how... Out of the thousands and thousands of stories I've read for the channel, like... There's certain specific lines that once I hear that line, I, sp I remember that story exactly. It's just, it's crazy how your mind works like that. So this next video is going to be my true scary stories number eight. It is literally the eighth video I did of true scary stories. 
like my number eight. So I'm recording on a cell phone, shitty ass computer, all that. You'll be able to hear how I used to sound back then, all that stuff. But it's uh, it's an old school video. Hope you all enjoy, and if not, well, that sucks. Lucinda, send me an email after this. I mean, you have a tattoo of the channel. You should have access to this, whether you're a patron or not. So uh, send me an email, and I'll see if I can find the link to send you so you can actually listen to these old stories. As far as I'm concerned, you're not a patron, but, I mean, you have the channel literally tattooed on you. So uh, least I could do is hook, y'all, hook you up with some old school stuff, so that way you can say you are well versed in all of your makers stories so uh, yeah send me an email email i'll hit you up after this for sure and for those of you that want access and you don't have a your maker tattoo make sure you go check out patreon if you want to support the channel that's the best way to do it you get yourself some cool perks early access ex exclusive streams a custom discord that's just for us you have personal access to me pretty much like at all times during my random ass sleep schedule all that good shit and uh, let's go ahead and listen to True Scary Stories number eight. Man, old school. The following are true scary stories from the subreddit Let's Not Meet. Listen to Baby I'll have Your a Maker. Link in the description below. Teddy had it right, Baby Your if Maker. If you enjoy this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for Ooh, more. You all in for I really a treat. appreciate the support. This last week, my channel's quadrupled in size, and the views are just out of this world there's no other words to explain it so once again thank you and let's begin okay this happened to me when I was about 14 years old so back in 2004 my parents and I lived in a rather affluent area and my high school was known for being the best in our city during the fall semester there were a lot of attempted abductions at other high schools near ours but being in the area we were, none of my friends, me, or anyone's parents were really concerned. Now, I used to walk to and from school. In order to get back home, I would have to cross the street, walk around a roundabout to get onto a path in the woods. I should pause it right here and let y'all know. And y'all are about to hear how bad I was at mixing music over my audio. It got better as it went, but it came down to comments of people being like, Yo, dude. It sounds like your your voice is having an argument with the audio and the, the music's winning. So, excuse the music, but you're going to hear the history behind the channel and how it uh, got to how it is. So, let's get back into it. And then after a kilometer or so, walk through a gate onto a street and finally walk down the rather steep street to my house. This leads me to my story. After school one day in early November, it was raining pretty hard and I was trying to get through the crowds as fast as possible to walk home quickly. As I'm crossing the roundabout, I see a brown car pull up to where I usually enter the woods. As I walk by the car, the passenger side's window rolls down. He yells, hey, at me, and I turn around and see two men sitting in the car. I ignore him, and he yells again, get in the car, we can drive you home, it's raining so hard you might get sick. At this point, I'm thinking nothing of it. Just some creeps trying to get my attention, so I shake my head visibly at him and enter the woods. To this day, I can't explain what happened. As I'm walking through the woods, I literally feel a push from behind me, as if someone used both hands to push me forward. I turn around and there's no one behind me, but my whole body is screaming, RUN! I ended up sprinting through the forest, feeling completely freaked out, although no one was behind me or chasing me. I exit the woods and start running down the street. Halfway down, my umbrella breaks in half. I quickly duck down beside a large truck and am cursing as I'm trying to put it back together. Now the truck is completely making me invisible to anyone on the street. You couldn't have been able to see me if you were on the other side of the road driving in a car. So as I'm crouched beside the truck, I see through the bottom of it there's a car driving up the street. My heart stops. The car pulls up to the exit from the woods where I just ran out of, and the two men start yelling at each other to run in. The last thing I remember hearing is one of them yelling, She has to still be in the woods. Go! 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 After I see them run into the woods, I grab my broken umbrella and run as fast as humanly possible to my house. 
I get inside and for over an hour, I watch the blinds as they circle around my street, stopping every so often at my house and other houses trying to see inside. To this day, I think an angel saved my life, and I can't even imagine what would have happened had something not pushed me in the woods. So to the two assholes who tried to abduct me, let's not me. Stalking seems to be a reoccurring theme on this subreddit as of late. This has led to the hesitation, on my part, concerning the encounter that I am about to share. This happened in 2010, I was about 27 at the time. I worked in a refurbished office space that used to be a Target, a glorified cubicle farm. I had been working there about a year when I met Kyla. Kyla was cute, with a slightly epic build, short in stature, 4'11", with blondish hair. I, on the other hand, was a strappy guy, I've since put on weight, tall and athletic, having always been in the bodybuilding during my youth. Kyla was part of an incoming group of newbies at the office who were there for training. I noticed her and thought I would ask her to lunch. She agreed. She didn't say much during her lunch date in the break room. Having been shy most of my life, I could hardly blame her. Our conversation consisted of me asking her questions and her making little noises which did not correspond with anything being asked. I thought I was going nowhere with her, having surely talked her head off. As I thanked her for the lunch date, I started getting up from the table when she said, I'm really interested in AIDS. Taken off guard by this comment, I stand there perplexed as she gets up and leaves. Months pass and life goes on. Training classes come and go. I was working for the government at the time and our- Bros, I remember this story so much. So many people have asked me about this story and I never knew which video it was in. But it turns out we found it. This story, this chick is obsessed with AIDS. I'm only telling you this because my audio is extremely low as you can hear over it. But she's extremely obsessed with AIDS. And it's one of the weirdest stories I've ever done. I've never quite understood it. And I've had a lot of people ask which video it was in. Turns out you're all about to hear it. And it also turns out it wasn't my second video that I started that sound. Because we're in number 8 and I didn't have that sound. So it was somewhere after this. Someone's like, dude, we don't know when your stories end and begin. But uh, yeah. I figured I'd put a little behind the scenes. I remember this story. I've had a lot of people ask which video this AIDS obsessed lady was in so uh yeah and jenny i appreciate you dropping in on your lunch break glad you made it our office space trained people from all over the state so it was not uncommon to see people from those training classes integrated into our work units most were often hired from elsewhere but came to us for training i had a routine every afternoon wherein i would walk to the break room and get some tea as I was making my way back to my cube one day, a supervisor from another unit, Teresa, stops me, pulling me into a cubicle. Hey, who is that person that keeps following you? Confused, I ask the obvious. What are you talking about? She replies, Every day when you're walking to the break room, there is a girl walking a few paces behind you. Is she your friend? I told Teresa that I wasn't aware of anyone walking behind me and priding myself in having a good sense of awareness about my surroundings, just thought they were messing with me. Teresa continued, She is short, blonde, light-complected. I couldn't match the description to anyone who worked in my direct or surrounding units. I prodded her for more information. How long has this been going on? A while now. We call her your little dog because she is always following you around. I was really confused, and before I could say anything else, I just found myself walking back to my cubicle. I began to look around me every time I go to get my tea. When I would walk back, I would make eye contact with Teresa to see if she could identify this mythical person. Teresa would only return my confused looks, as whatever activity she had witnessed was no longer taking place. I didn't know what to think. I was convinced somebody was fucking with me. Not shortly after that, things began to come up missing from my desk. Pens, notepads, etc. Since it was an open environment, I figured people were just being liberal with my things. It was not until I began coming up in the mornings where I would find my phone cord wrapped around my computer monitor with my phone off the hook, notes telling me how nice I looked the previous day, and random annoyances which ran the gamut from mildly annoying to creepy. I kept a detailed record of these things just in case. 
This went on for about a week. On some random day, I received an email from somebody who I didn't recognize but was in our office global. The title of the email said, Interesting Developments About HIV and AIDS Vaccine. I opened the email and there was a link to a story about HIV and AIDS research. It was signed by Kyla. My first thought was that, that I wasn't aware she was even in our office, as it had been almost a year since we had last spoke, and I would have been aware of a new hire. I am sure I must have missed something. Then I began to receive email after email, some about HIV and AIDS and others about how she can't stop thinking about me and our date. I replied to one of these emails politely and told her that it was nice to hear from her because I didn't know what happened to her after training. This clearly encouraged her. One day, as I was going to the bathroom, I felt someone pull me into one of the training rooms which were adjacent to the men's room. The pull on my arm was violent and intense. I had done some sparring with my father who was a judoka and I recognized a good tug when I felt one. The room was dark and I could barely see the outline of a female now in front of me. She began to laugh hysterically, pushing me hard against the wall, the back of my head connecting with force. With a sudden intensity, she placed her hands on my belt and began to try and undo it, all the while telling me she wanted to share something special with me. I was frozen in fear. I wondered if I was being raped. I couldn't hit her. This was a woman, and every attempt to push her off of me just increased her eagerness to continue. I desperately reached for a light switch, and to my surprise and utter dismay, it's Kyla, staring at me wide-eyed with the utmost intensity. I asked her what she was doing, and she said that she couldn't stop thinking about our date. Thinking how wildly inappropriate this would all seem had someone walk in, I pull up my pants, compose myself, and begin to head out to the door to the training room. This is when she begins commanding that I look at her, in a tone that felt both alien and uncharacteristic given my previous interaction with her. I feel a hard shove from my back, moving me forward, catching myself halfway to the ground. She starts laughing and just walks away. By this time I am so utterly fucking confused, I go into the men's room and try and compose myself. Had she been the person Teresa said was following me? What just happened? As absurd as it may sound, I really fear I was going to be raped? This, unfortunately, is not the end, and it gets much, much worse. I didn't report her right away because I didn't know how to go about reporting a case of male sexual harassment. In hindsight, I should have done this sooner rather than later, as the events which followed caused some irreparable to my reputation with this employer. After my previous altercation with Kyla, things escalated. She had been reassigned to a unit which sat a row of cubicles behind me. I could feel her gaze burning the back of my head on a daily basis, and given the past I regretfully now shared with her, it made me quite uncomfortable. At this employer, we had a corporate instant messaging service which was meant to be used to contact someone on our network if we had any questions concerning something we were working on. It is here that I started to receive messages from her, which was smart on her part as the only way I could save them was from taking a screenshot unlike the emails. She began taunting me for not having taken her in the training room and telling me that I wasn't much of a man. I tried my best to ignore these. I didn't know how to go about reporting this to upper management, but I knew I had to, somehow. We often worked ridiculously late hours at this job, and by the time it was time to leave, it would be dark outside. The parking lot lights were in dire need of repair, so there was sporadic visibility. No problem. I would often walk people to their cars to make sure they got there safely without incident. On some occasions, Kyla would park next to my car once she found out what make and model I had and would be there, waiting. At this time, rumors came back to me that her and I were seeing each other. Due to workplace rules, this was something I was never willing to undertake, especially in light of our previous situation. Nevertheless, some of the women who, with who she is began to associate with gave me messages during work asking me if certain things about our relationship were true. Things like whether or not we were really seeing each other, and if it was true that I had been intimate with her in the training room. I denied any and all of the claims, but the nature of the gossip in this place was working against me. I decided to stay as low as I possibly could, which was difficult given my position there, and I decided to tell Kyla that enough was enough. I asked via email if she could meet me in the break room, public enough, because we needed to talk. She agreed enthusiastically. 
When we met, I asked her to stop doing these things, that we were co-workers, and that nothing could become of it. I realized that I had begun everything by asking her to lunch that day long ago, but felt that this had gone beyond that lunch date, which led to nothing. She stayed quiet for the entirety of our conversation, and once finished, she asked me if I was done. She then looks at me, wounded, and says my name in a melodic way that still disturbs me to this day. She asked me how I could have done this to her, and she storms off. Thinking that things would settle down from here on out, I decided I had done the right thing. She then stops coming into work. This lasted a good week or so, and I said nothing of the matter. Not my suspicions, not anything, and just played it cool. Random people would come to my cubicle and ask if I had seen her, heard from her. I would always deny that we knew each other outside of work. Then the rumors began to surface that maybe I had done something to her and that she had to seek medical help. I went into full-on panic mode at this point. I didn't know what I had to do, but I had to do something. That rumor had been passed to me by someone in low management who was privy to some inner office banner, asking me if it was true. I absolutely denied it and began to get every email and screenshot that I could. This happened to me on Friday. The following Monday, Kyla showed back up to work dressed to the nines, heels, skirt, her hair straightened. This girl was beautiful, I will give her that much. The entire day she played it up and was center of attention. It was unavoidable. She would pass by my cubicle and smile every so often and would also flirt with some of my coworkers, making eye contact with me the entire time. That day I went out to lunch by myself and drove back to work. Once in the parking lot, immediately after parking and the automatic locks unlocked, my passenger door swung asunder and Kyla throws herself into my vehicle. I ask her what she is doing there and I begin to pull the key out of the ignition when she reaches over and pulls my right hand by the wrist. Again, taken by surprise, it takes me a few seconds to realize what is happening. In shock, I feel her pulling my arm again, my shoulder aching at this point as she pulls up her skirt with her free hand and tries to force my hand into her underwear. She begins to moan excitedly and tells me that she has something for me, and begins to scratch my forearm the minute I pull away, missing but comes close. I don't know what it was, but the words AIDS, open wound, and blood flashed before my eyes as I heard her laughing once more as she had done before. Are you fucking crazy? I had lost it at this point. If you don't fuck me in your car right here and now, she tells me authoritatively. I am going to tell everyone that you raped me. I was in utter disbelief. What the fuck twilight zone had I walked into? I told her to get out of my car as I did so myself. She complies, not before burying her heel into my upholstery and slamming the door with tremendous force. As she did so, she took her heels off and ran back into the building. The timing could not have been worse, as several of my co-workers were just coming back from lunch themselves and witnessed her leaving, faking tears from my car. Once inside, I am confronted by upper management, who pulled me into a meeting and asked me if I assaulted Kyla. She relayed to them fake accounts of me assaulting her in her apartment and raping her several times, the most recent which had occurred a mere half hour prior to our meeting. Before security was called, I asked them if I could send them emails and chat transcripts that I had gathered. They agreed. As I made my way back to my cubicle, I wondered if I would lose my job over these false accusations. I was no doubt in the fight of my life. When I got back to my desk, just about everyone stared at me like I had done something wrong. I did not have the face to do anything other than what I had come back to do. At that moment, I received a phone call from my mom who was in the middle of an emergency herself. As I stepped outside to take this quick call, binder of messages in hand, Kyla follows me and before I can ask my mom what is wrong, feel her push me against the chain link fence which partitioned the parking lot. Kyla begins to say my name over and over again in that haunting melodic tone. We need to talk. Please let me talk. We need to talk. She would say over and over. No, please leave me alone, I pleaded with. No matter where I moved, she kept following, shouting, louder and louder for me to pay attention to her. I could not hear my mom on the other end, so I tried to make my way back inside through a side door. Once back inside, I assured my mom that as soon as I was done here, I would go get her. Heading back to the meeting room, I make my way through the center of the building, cubicles on both ends. Kyla storms into the building behind me, shouting loudly over everything and everyone behind me. Why won't you pay attention to me? What did I do to you? 
with complete abandon. I picked up the pace and by some miracle, once I get to the meeting room door, upper management comes out to see the commotion and it catches her in the act. She threatens to kill me and to go to the police concerning my having raped her in front of all of our coworkers. Upper management with security and HR interview us separately and conclude that she's instigated everything from the get-go. The binder of messages I had kept is what sealed the deal. I handed everything over to them, complete access to everything. At the end of the day, she was terminated. Before leaving, security escort accompanying her. She began to spread rumors of how we were expecting twins and I would be a wonderful father. That was the last I ever saw of her. As some of you have asked, how did this affect my reputation there? Well, it was never the same after Kyla. People would continue to talk about what had happened and wondered, because of my musculature and stature, whether or not any of those were true accusations. After a while, it was no longer fulfilling for me to show up to work, especially when I was viewed by a lot of my co-workers with a suspicious gaze. Nevertheless, I left that place and went to meet my wife shortly thereafter. To this day, I am left with a lot more questions than answers. What was her problem? The obsession with AIDS and her obsession with wanting to gift me something. Was she truly that mad? I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more. I let go the second I get done with the skill check and it's like here we'll have another one. I think they added it where as soon as you let go there's going to be a skill check. So yeah, for those of you that are just joining, we're listening to some old school videos from uh, when I first started narrating. This is me live in the background playing some Dead by Daylight on my PlayStation 4. As you see, I look like Jesus. You see my face? I'm Jesus. Yeah. But yeah, that's what we're doing. You'll be able to hear uh, where the channel came from. These are some good stories, too. <laughs> Kind of wish I would have narrated him a little bit better, you know, but, uh, I don't know who the purple haired chick is. I'm assuming that's, uh, just a random. I don't recognize the name. Normally the purple haired chick is Teddy. He's usually the one, but, uh, yeah, it's not him. So what we'll do now is we'll listen to, that one was True Scary Stories number eight. What we'll listen to now is True Scary Stories number 22. And I did them all in order. So that means that, you know, it's the 22nd video that I did. Oh my god, I almost missed that skill check. That guy's still fucking crawling? Alright, before I get into the story, I gotta do this. Because, uh, one time's running out. Got to make sure I heal this guy real quick. Got him up at least. And that guy got off the hook already. So I'll come over here and mend myself and let's uh, start these next ones. This is True Scary Stories number 22. The following are True Scary Stories found on the subreddit Let's Not Meet. I'll have a link in the description below. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe so you can catch all of my future content. Let's begin. My mother came home late one night in a panic. She was sure she was being followed. This is her story. I was coming back from my friend's house. It was about 2 a.m. when I left and I had a bit of a drive mostly freeway. I was the only one on the freeway, zoning out and listening to George Norrie. I didn't notice another car had joined me, until they were riding right on my tail. I thought it was odd that they wouldn't just pass me since we were the only ones in sight. The car moved to the left lane and I was relieved that they had decided to go around me, until they didn't. Instead of passing me, the car stayed at my same speed exactly parallel to me. I thought it was a little odd, but probably just an accident on their part. The car was nothing special, just an old black car with a solo male driver. I decided to give the guy some space and slowed down to about 60 miles per hour. 
From the left lane, he too slowed down until we were once again side by side. So I speed up to nearly 80. Within seconds, he gained speed and was right next to me again. It became clear that this was no mistake. The only thing on my mind was not being alone with this car. I sped up trying to catch up with any cars on the road. In the way distance, I saw a tow truck, which became my target. As I raced to reach the truck, the car was parallel to me the entire time. I reached the truck just in time to see a signal and take the exit off the freeway. My mind was racing with every news story of drive-by shootings I had heard, when I noticed a police car parked in the distance. The black car must have noticed it as well. He dropped way back behind me and got into the right lane. As soon as we both had passed the police car, the black car wasted no time in catching right back up. In hindsight, I should have just pulled it behind the police car, but I had no idea what to say. I was being driven next to. I had to lose this guy. I slammed on the gas and was going about 95. He was doing 95 right next to me. I was so scared and I was driving way too fast and I didn't know what to do. I grabbed my phone and started to dial 911. He must have seen the light from my screen because immediately he dropped way back until I almost couldn't even see his lights. I sped up and took my exit, racing home. I'm a little nervous that he saw where I got off, but I sped home so I don't think he was following me. I don't think there is anything I can do about it, except think twice about driving late at night. So what do you guys think? My only idea was perhaps a group of prankster teens, but my mom said it was only one person in the car. Are there any other similar stories like this? Damn it, I was trying to struggle for my life and uh, switch chat, but it didn't work doing both. Teddy, thanks so much for the support, my brother. He wants to put out a public service announcement, announcement for the chat. We are okay with a lot of stuff in the chat, but certain things are not okay. Got button topics like rape, politics, and religion will earn you a timeout, as well as too much cursing. Very true. We don't talk about uh, rape, politics, or religion here. Some things that uh, I've drawn the line at the very beginning. So uh, make sure you keep that in mind. Thanks so much, Teddy, for doing, doing your thing, dude. I really do appreciate it. Mute my game. Yeah, I'm muted right now. It should be muted during the stories, right? I think. It should be muted during the stories. Like, the only way I can do it is where I have it on the television. I assume it must have been when I'm talking that it was really loud yeah thank you lucinda sorry about that but uh yeah cursing cursing's cool just not not in like crazy excess you know we all are adults here well most of us are adults here so just keep the cursing to where it uh remains pertinent everything thanks so much teddy i appreciate you doing you dude all right let's get back into this Last night, my sister and I, 24 and 26, decided to go jogging at night by our house. We don't live in the best area, but it's also not the worst. That is to say, most of the people in my neighborhood are well-meaning good folks, but there are also still a lot of shady characters that spill over from the really bad areas surrounding us. So, down the block from our house, there's a block that stretches really long with a church on one side of the road and an elementary school on the other. The school takes up the whole square block, so my sister and I decide to jog around the perimeter. This isn't our first time we've done this, but this is the first time we've done it at night. Several laps in, as we jogged along the side of the school that runs along the main road, a white car drives by in the same direction that we are running in. For reference, at this time of night, there are not many cars on the road here. There might be one or two cars every five minutes on a busy night. There are also no people out. We didn't come across any other pedestrians the entire time we were out there. My sister and I are both vigilant people, so we take a glance at the vehicle. The car had heavily tinted, 
pitch black windows, making it impossible to see the driver or anyone else inside. This made us both tentative, as the car was driving at a slow pace, matching the pace of our jog. My sister, who's a few years older than me, told me to stay calm and just look straight. We were coming up on the corner of the school where we turned left to continue along its perimeter. Continually talking through the side of her mouth so as not to alert the person or persons in the car and let them know that we were alarmed, my sister told me to run really fast once we turned the corner. You might be thinking that they could have just easily turned the corner with us. That's true, but once we turned the corner and got to the end of the block, we'd be turning left again since we were jogging along the perimeter of the school. The car, however, would not be able to make another left turn as there was a stone barricade that stopped cars from driving along that side of the school as a safety precaution in case children ran out of the playground during recess. So, the plan was to turn left, jet down the street, and make the second left that they wouldn't be able to make. Well, we never had to do that because just a couple of feet short of the corner, the car suddenly sped up and made a quick right turn driving out of sight. We still made the left turn and jogged about halfway down the block before we felt safe enough to stop, catch our breath, and take a good look behind us. They were gone, but we still didn't feel safe continuing with our workout, so we decided to make our way home. We start to walk back and reach the corner we just turned around when we see headlights quickly approaching across from us. On the road the car just sped down. It was a white car again. They must have doubled back. My heart dropped into my gut. I said something along the lines of, Oh my gosh, it's the same car. To my sister, who had already picked up on it also. We were walking at this point, not jogging. If we turned right, we'd be walking alongside of the school. If we turned left, we'd be walking towards home, which was about two blocks away. If we went straight, we'd be heading straight for the white car, which at this point was just sitting at the intersection with no indication of making a move. What was scarier now was that the front passenger window was open and a guy was hanging out of it. In other words, his legs were in the car, but he was seated on the window ledge so that his entire body was hanging out and his arms resting on the roof of the car for support. He was a young guy probably in his 20s, and looked kind of rough. If there was any chance before that their actions had nothing to do with us, it was pretty much gone now, as the guy was staring directly at us. So, to put it into perspective, we approach the corner about the same time the car approaches the opposite corner with the guy hanging out of the window staring straight at us. Before another second goes by, My sister grabs my arm and pulls me down with her as she does a squat. She gets back up and does another squat. She continues to drag me up and down with her as she squats, but I give her a really confused look and never take over the voluntary squat with her. I bulged my eyes out and gave her a look that screamed, Are you literally doing squats when there are potential killers right across the road looking at us? She just whispered through gritted teeth. Just go with the flow. My sister would later explain to me that she did this because, no matter which direction we ran or walked in, there were no cars, no people, and a lot of open road. We had nowhere to run and effectively no way to get away. So the only strategy that she could think of was to stay put and possibly throw them off. The last thing that she wanted to do was to show them that we were scared because predators like to feed on fear and often pounce when they feel like their victims are cornered. Scared? Please. We don't even notice you guys. We're just having a nice workout, doing squats. That was the vibe we were trying to give. But inside, we were freaking out, our hearts racing. At this point, we could hear people talking in the car, as the road was dead and there was nothing to drown out their voices. But they were too far away to make out their words. About a minute passed like this, the car just frozen at the intersection, the passenger's eyes frozen on us, and the windshield too black to see the driver or any other passengers. 
Then the most wonderful thing happened. We could see headlights from a car approaching on the road to our left. I was already planning in my head to wave it down for help once it got to the intersection. But the nearing presence of another car must have prompted the men in the white car to make a move first. They slowly turned left, which meant they were coming right at us and would be turning right past the corner we were standing on. My sister threw the we're not scared play right out the window at that moment, throwing her arms across my chest and pushing me back a few paces in case they made a move and tried to grab us before the other car approached the intersection. As they made their way by us, we could finally see what we were dealing with. There were four guys in the car, the driver, the front passenger hanging out of the window, and two back passengers. They all stared at us menacingly as they passed, and we stared back, my sister's arms still across my chest like a mama bear holding her cub back. The scariest part of all came from the front passenger. Whilst looking at us, says, The wolves are hungry tonight. Then he cocks his head back and starts howling to the sky while repeatedly banging on the roof of the car with his hands. The other guys in the car join in in the howling and the back passenger on our side sticks his head out as far as he can and bangs on the side of the door with his arm. The chilling part about this is that my sister and I had been part of the children's theater production of Little Red Riding Hood months before, and we were both wearing the t-shirts that we had from the event. They were red and said the Little Red Riding Hood on the front. So as soon as the guy made the wolf comment, my sister and I made the connection. Whatever their intentions were, they were sinister. The guys continued to howl as they drove off and once they had gotten several feet ahead of us, they sped off, taking the red light at the next intersection. The other car had pulled up at this point, but since the guys were gone, we ran home as fast as we could. We figured they would double back again to terrorize us some more. Thankfully, we made it home, locking the door behind us. We promised we would never work out at night again. So... To the wolf pack that turned a nighttime jog into a run for your life moment. Let's not meet. For those of you joining, I appreciate it. Yeah, I wasn't too sneaky in that one. I was actually on my back porch, so I couldn't even hear if the killer was around me. So I was surprised I even lived that long. Uh, so yeah, not not as sneaky as I'd like to be. I'm not my sneaky person. This is just, I'm just, I should actually switch over to my sneaky person. Let me do that. I'm going to switch over to my sneaky person. Uh, we'll go near. We'll sne- switch over to my sneaky person. That way we can actually do the sneaky stuff. All right. Yeah, that person, I'm just trying to unlock stuff. So I, I really don't have too much equipped for that person. But uh, as you can see, this person's bloody. She's been through some stuff. Look at her face. And Teddy... My wife thought it was the funniest thing, dude. She pointed this out, and she's all, she was talking about how when me and you play, she's all, you're all pink-haired out and all floofy, and I'm like the dykest chick you can get. (laughs) It's the funniest thing ever. It's such a contrast. It's amazing. But uh, I appreciate you doing your thing, Teddy. I see you in there. And everyone else who's just joining, what we're doing is we're listening to some of my older stories back from when I, like, very first started the channel. These videos are all unlisted so a lot of you probably haven't heard them unless you're a patron there's a page whoops i went back to my video game i literally have hundreds of video game videos that are also unlisted and i also have a series that i did before youtube which was uh wacky worldwide news but like i'm going through like i'm seeing all that old stuff and it's just bringing back so many memories but uh that's what we're doing. We're listening to some older stories right now. Some of the ones that only the patrons have access to at this point. So if you do want to support the channel and get yourself some cool perks, make sure you check out Patron. It's in the link in the description. You'll get yourself access to a lot of videos, like over 24 hours worth of content from my very first video on. A lot of these videos you're hearing right now are actually completely unlisted. So you wouldn't even be able to find them if you wanted to. 
And speaking of, we'll listen to that last one was True Scary Stories number 22. We'll listen to True Scary Stories number 30. I think that'll be a nice one. Yeah, Lizzie, you've been around a while. You'll probably remember some of these. Those of you that have been around since the beginning of my channel, you'll remember these. The following. And my intro has always started the same. So uh, enjoy this uh, flashback to when the channel began. Thank you, David. I see you up in there, brother. Hail. I hope you're having a wonderful daily day as well. Following are true scary stories found on the subreddit Let's Not Meet. I'll have a link in the description below if you would like to read along with me. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe so you can catch all of my future content. Let's begin. Yes, Onik, throwback. This for began sure. back in February for sure. when I was 18. I've always looked much younger than I really am, thanks to being extremely short and not very curvy. I'm afraid to say that I think my overall childlike appearance is what initially drew him to me. I met him at work. He was a new employee, tall, with a muscular build and tannish skin. I was homeschooled, and as a consequence, I am painfully shy and socially awkward. I have a hard time starting a conversation with anyone, so I kinda just wait for someone else to make the first move, which was what this guy did. He introduced himself as Corey, and we talked about our favorite music genres and bands. Turns out, we liked a lot of the same ones. He seemed like a pretty normal guy overall, and for the next few weeks, things were great. Then, one day, he asked if I had a boyfriend or not. I told him I didn't, and he immediately asked me out. I'm a lesbian, but I live in the South, so I didn't really want to out myself at my job. I politely declined, saying that I wasn't ready for that sort of relationship. But it didn't end there. He began calling me by pet names, such as Darling or Babe, in spite of my request for him to stop. He sent me a series of uncomfortable emails. The first was him begging me to never stop loving him and to stay with him forever. I again reminded him that we weren't a couple. His response, that he knew that I loved him, followed by ten more desperate pleas that I never leave him. Feeling thoroughly creeped out by that point, I tried to come up with a way to end it. I started by talking to my boss, but that didn't do any good as he refused to change either of our schedules, or even talk to Corey about any of my concerns. My attempts to tell Corey I wasn't interested in a romantic relationship just went in one ear and out the other. By now, Corey was starting to open up to me a little more about his life and world views. He claimed his father was the leader of an infamous group of criminals that had murdered tons of people. I have no idea if that was actually true or not, but if it was, I guess it would explain a lot. Corey told me that he'd been in trouble with the law before as well, for stalking an elementary school playground and taking pictures of kids. One day, he comes into work really upset. His best friend didn't want to talk to him anymore because all he ever talked about was me. By then, I had barely been acknowledging him I'd just been trying to do my job as he talked to me, occasionally nodding when it seemed necessary. The idea that he'd become so preoccupied with me that he was alienating his friends disturbed me. His third reveal was that he was a vampire. He genuinely believed that he was a fantasy creature. He showed me the scars on his wrist, explaining that he cut himself in order to drink his own blood. He then asked me if he could drink some of my blood. I had no fucking idea what to say, and pretty much just stared at him, dumbfounded. Soon after that, something kinda strange happened. I don't really know for sure, and I might be jumping to conclusions now that I know more about this creep, but I think he tried to drug me. I went to my water cup, only to find that it wasn't on the counter where I thought I'd left it. 
After looking around for a couple of seconds, Corey handed it to me. I thought nothing of it. Working in a kitchen gets hectic, and I figured I'd just forgotten where I'd left it. But shortly after that, I started to feel really off. I was super nauseous and dizzy. I suddenly felt really tired, and I was having trouble holding on to utensils I was using to cook. Corey was now encouraging me to go help him get something from the freezer. I have the metaphobia, which is the fear of vomiting, so my first thought was that I was terribly ill and that I was about to throw up at work. I was having trouble speaking, but I told Corey that I couldn't help him because I didn't feel well, and I took off to the bathroom. The idea that I had gotten some sort of stomach flu caused me to have a panic attack. I think that the anxiety attack was the only reason I didn't end up passing out. Again, I don't know if he actually drugged me, but the symptoms I experienced, along with his persistence to get me to come with him to the freezer, seemed to point in that direction. The week after that, I got off work early, so I went to one of my favorite stores in the area. After I'd left, Corey begged to be let off early as well, and followed me into the store without my knowledge. I didn't realize he was there until I noticed a camera flash. He was following me to take pictures of me. I yelled at him to knock it off, and that's when I noticed the book he was looking at. It was a book about life as an LGBT individual. He proceeded to flip his fucking shit, demanding to know if I was gay. I told him it wasn't any of his business what I was. His response was to launch into a jumbled and homophobic rant about how I needed him to cure me. In the middle of it, I started to cry. This guy had harassed me at work for months now, and there he was, acting like I was the sick one. He proceeded to do a 180 faster than the speediest of politicians. He insisted he hadn't meant to upset me, and that I should let him give me a hug to make me feel better. I told him I just wanted him to leave me alone. He didn't. He followed me all through the store. He explained to me that I owed him sex because he'd lost his best friend because of me. He also confessed that this wasn't the first time he had followed me into a store. He had found me at the grocery store with my mom one day. He then went into great detail about exactly what she and I were wearing, getting everything correct, right down to the little eyeball keychain I had on my belt loop and the Hemingway house shirt my mom had on. It continued until my dad finally showed up to get me. I told my dad about how much Corey had upset me, and my dad tried to cheer me up, but I don't think he really picked up on how scared I was. I was scared that he would tell other people at work I was gay, I was scared that he knew where my mom and I shopped. I was scared that he would rape me. He was a good two feet taller than me, and I was barely a hundred pounds when soaking wet. I wouldn't stand a chance if he decided he wanted to attack me. I started to dread going to work more than ever. On the days I knew he'd be there, my stomach would twist into knots of concern and worry. Finally, he didn't show up one day and another girl who worked there explained to me that he had been fired. He had had a complete meltdown one day and cursed out the boss. But it didn't end there. Over the next couple weeks, when he knew the manager wouldn't be around, he'd come in. He'd just stand at the front counter and stare into the kitchen, watching me. On a few occasions, I saw him holding up his phone and I'm pretty sure he was taking pictures of me. That lasted a couple of weeks, and then stopped abruptly. Eventually, I found out what happened from one of Corey's relatives, who also worked at that location. Corey was in police custody. He had drugged and raped a girl. I felt sick when I heard the news. She was only 12 years old. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if he wouldn't have been fired. What if I would have gone in the freezer with him when he'd asked? I wonder if he would have attacked me. Would he have left that little girl alone?
I lived in a house with my mother and my younger sister. It was in a nice neighborhood, with a lot of kids, and the houses were even fairly nice. My sister and I knew the kids next door. Their mom was a lot like ours, but she smoked and had a lot of bad friends and bad ex-boyfriends, my friend's dad. She would always go on about how he was a horrible guy and he was such a deadbeat and she was happy he was locked in jail. One day the eldest kid was at my friend's house and since his sister was the same age as mine, I was watching them. When the two girls were out on the balcony playing, I heard Layla, the neighbor kid, yell, Dad! And my direct response was, What the fuck, I thought he was locked up. He started walking towards my house, and I heard the girls inside, which was hard because Layla was refusing to come in the house due to seeing her dad. Once he got to the house, he knocked once on the door and yelled, Give me my baby! I know she's with you. I had no idea what to do. Do I call the cops? I didn't have the mom's number, so I stupidly opened the door. He didn't seem like a deadbeat, he obviously just wanted his kid. When I opened, he looked me up and down, and just stared for at least five seconds. I instantly regret opening the door. My clothes weren't even skimpy or tight. What the fuck was he looking at? So, uh, where's my kid? I respond asking if he can please wait till her mother is home because I'm babysitting and I need all my money. I had no other excuse. He nodded his head and said, Okay, but can I at least come in? You know, to see my daughter? I was just staring into space, then said, Uh, no, but I can bring her to the door. After they talked a little while, she came back inside and said, My daddy wants to talk to you. I walked up to the door, and he had the biggest smile on his face, then said, You take care of my baby, and yourself. I don't want you to hurt those hips of yours. And then he just walked off. That was fucking weird, and I started to wonder... How did he even know where they lived if he was in jail? She seriously stayed in the same house that he knew about while in jail? I didn't tell my mom about what he had said when she got home, because I didn't want to cause problems, considering she's crazy when it comes to creeps. The mom next door eventually got back together with him, and he lived there now. Nothing else creepy happened after that, so I started to forget about it. Fast forward two and a half weeks later, and my friend's dad is dropping me off one night after work, and we don't have a key card to my gate, so he drops me off at the bottom of the hill by my house, and asks me if I'm okay to go up the hill. I told him I was fine, and I started to make my way up the hill. When I was about halfway up, I saw Layla's dad smoking a cigarette by the community dumpster. I proceeded to walk faster, And right when I passed by, he yelled, Hey! Aren't you the girl next door? While basically power walking up the hill, I said, Yeah, and tried to get home. He started walking up with me and asking questions like, How old are you? You drink? Then I thought, Maybe he didn't know I was 15, and even though I didn't look like I was 21, Maybe he thought I was at least 18. I said, I'm 15, sir. He chuckled and asked, Sir? Okay, I like that. We can try different pet names, though. I kept walking as fast as I could and pulled my shirt down at least till it covered my ass. And he said, I can still see it, baby. You can't cover that. I looked back to see how close he was to see if I could make a run for it. Once I turned around, I noticed he had his hand down his pants. He was playing with himself. Disgusting. Especially since he had a girlfriend who lived right next to me. Like, what the actual fuck? He was only about five or six feet away from me, so I took my night bag, threw it on my back, 
and made a run for it. He tried to catch up with me, yelling, Don't you tell anybody about this! I will get you if you do! It was no use. He was about 40 and on the chunky side. Lucky for me, my house was close and I started pounding on the door and told my mom everything. She called the cops and told the children's mom. She didn't look surprised. He was on parole already and was taken into custody. I don't know much after that and I don't really care. I'm in a whole new state, but I have family in that city, so hopefully I don't ever see him again. If you enjoyed this- Alright, so I'm actually trying to look for a hatch right now. But I'm probably not going to find it, so one person's going to live through this game. Lucky bastard. Would have been nice if it was in there. <clears throat> I'll start another video here in just a second. I don't think I'm going to find this guy in time or the hatch. So it should be over in just a second. As soon as this guy bleeds out. I'm sure the other guy's on the hatch. That's why he hasn't uh, revived him yet. Going over here. Yeah. Oh, was... Did he disconnect? Was he the last guy? I thought... It, was I just being an idiot? <laughs> I thought there was one more guy. Did I kill everybody? I did. Whoops. I'm an idiot. I just kind of let him bleed out, I guess. Whoops. Yeah. Well, that's killer for you. You just kind of can do that, I guess. That poor guy. He probably could have found the hatch. I wouldn't have felt bad if he would have found the hatch. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a killer for you. Let me find another video. Let me mute my audio, actually. This one's an old school one. This one's viewer submissions. This one you could find if you were to look it up. For some reason, there's no thumbnail. It shows like no thumbnail at all. I'm sure a lot of you probably didn't hear it, but it's uh, this one's old school. Oh my goodness. This was back with my old school intro as it probably just blew out your eardrums. I used to have an old intro. I still actually have it saved too to put it in. All right, well let's go ahead and we'll, we'll start these other story. And yeah, a lot of these are real early. Like uh Yeah, this uh a lot of these are really old. It's so crazy just to look back. These ones were viewer submitted. Um these are some of my earliest, and one of them has a new ar news article for it, so got a little bit of validation towards it. All right, let's listen to uh, Bearded Gunsmith says, you make her listen to your videos while doing homework. Keep up the great work. I appreciate that, dude. Glad I can help you occupy the time. Elaine Dodd, is that a banana? Appreciate the banana in the chat. Alright, let's get into these uh, old school videos. Y'all will hear where the channel came from. I have another guy. This story was submitted by Sarah Malaby Holland. My best friends and I had just gotten back from church. 
It was a really hot day in mid-July, and we decided to go swimming since it was the last free day before band camp started. There were a total of 10 of us, me, my brother, his girlfriend, and seven other friends. We went to a popular hangout spot where you could go swimming or even jump off the bluffs. There was also two other guys there who weren't part of our group, but I guess they were just trying to have a good time like the rest of us. We were there for a while and the boys were trying to get this rope that was tied to the bridge above us. Our friend Jeff jumped in first and he had no trouble getting out of the water. Then Austin jumped in and he also had no trouble getting out. Then Seth and James jumped in. They were only in the water for mere moments before I heard the screams. They haunt my dreams to this day. James started screaming for help, saying that he was drowning. Seth heard his cries and started swimming to him and Jeff and Austin jumped in too. James was panicking and now both Seth and James were drowning. At this point, we were all freaking out, and one of us called 911, along with a family who had saw what was going on and heard my screams. Austin then took hold of James and had him calmed enough to get him within three feet of the shore. But sadly, James let go and was swept away with the rising current. I knew it was time for me to make a phone call to my mom that we would never forget. Hey Bug, what's up? Mommy, we lost him. You lost who? At this point, my mom is thinking of my brother because neither of us know how to swim that well. Mama, we lost James. And then my mom said that I lost touch of what I was doing and I started screaming his name through tears. By the time she got my attention, she was already in the car, racing behind the ambulance and the police. I went to where everyone was standing, still trying to get Austin out of the water. The two guys who weren't from our group saw us in a panic, found out the cops were coming, and they booked it out of there. A week later, they found James's body, six miles upstream. For weeks, we were accused of killing him, but nothing like that ever happened. To this day, I have a massive fear of water, and I still have flashbacks of James's screams, and I still see him in the water. It's like a picture in my head. There will be a link to the news article covering this tragic story in the description below. I'm a 35 year old recently divorced man and I've decided that I need to get back in shape. I started going to the gym again and jogging. I work a 9 to 5 job so sometimes my workouts have to be done later at night. As most people can relate, 9 to 5 jobs sometimes turn into 9 to whenever you get all your work done, sometimes as late as 9 or 10 p.m. On this night, I had finished up work at around 8 p.m. and got home about a half hour later. It was a Wednesday, and because the last couple of nights at work had been equally late nights, I hadn't made it to the gym since that prior Saturday, so I decided that night to go, and afterwards, I would go for a run in town. In my very suburban town, there's a main road that is about a mile down and a mile back, and it's book ended by both of the main drags that cut through town. So pretty much, everyone from town, throughout the course of the day, will either run, walk their dogs, or ride bikes, or skate on this street. At a bare minimum, the entire town will at least drive on this road once a day. What I'm trying to get at is, it's heavily traveled, and you often see people you know. Hey Walt, 
one of my childhood friend's fathers was out walking his dog. Hello, Sandy. A mother whose son is in school with my nephew. Joan, how's Joe? I just saw Mary's Facebook video with your grandkids swimming. They're adorable and getting so big. It almost becomes more of a social event than a workout, but I think that's great. What's unusual about this road is at the beginning, or west end of the street. All the houses are estates, and rather expensive. Everyone has beautiful landscaping, and their lawns are all well manicured. But when you get down to the end of the road, the east side of the avenue, well, that's the other side of town. A church, a closed down school, lesser maintained houses, and a few little stores and offices. It's remarkable how you can almost watch the quality of residences diminish as you make your way down the road. It goes from expensive, well manicured homes to almost what could be considered an industrial section, all in a span of a mile. But as I said, near the end of the block, there are a few very poor looking homes. One of which is the focus of where my story begins. It was old looking, had faded gray paint on the aluminum siding, tall grass, and had a chain link fence with a beware of dog sign. The front lawn was littered with junk and car parts, and it had a very dark front porch. As I take notice of this house, I fail to realize that my pace slows a bit on my jog. I wipe the sweat from my face, and that's when I feel an intense sting on my right leg. I jump, as it feels like I was stung by a hornet. What the fuck? I look down, and I see green paint, made only visible by the street lights. I had been shot by a paintball, and oh man, do those things hurt. I pick my head up, look into the darkness, knowing the direction, but trying to figure out specifically where it came from. That's when I hear the laughter of at least two people. Does someone think this is funny? Because I'm not laughing. As I say this, the laughter intensifies, mocking me, and I hear a voice whisper, do it again. As I hear this, I decide to pick up my run again, and as I do, another paintball hits me, this time in the back of my shoulder, and then once again, on my right elbow. A few more whiz past me, and hit the street or the sidewalk near me. Now I'm really pissed. I'm sure it's just a teenage prank, but when you go paintballing, they make you wear protection for a reason. I stop, sigh a bit, and turn, making my way up to the person or person's residence. As I walk up to the house, I say, I know all of you probably think this is a pretty funny prank, but I don't see the humor. If you want to be men, come on out and we can have a nice talk. Just me and all of you. From out of the shadows of the dark porch, I see the red glow of a cigarette. At least, I think it's a cigarette at first, but a second later, my sense of smell reveals that it's clearly weed. A guy in his late forties, scruffy, complete trash, comes forward wearing a filthy pair of shorts and a black t-shirt. I'm sorry about my son and his friends. I'll take care of this, the man says calmly, then yells out, Billy, open fire. Upon the order, all I hear is the loud, rapid sound of firing paintball guns. And amazingly, they were all aimed poorly because they missed me with every shot as I made my way down to the end of the road and took a left. The police station is literally two blocks down, so I decide I'll just run to it 
and show them the physical evidence of what took place. As I get a few more paces away from the house, and what I believe is out of range, I hear the gate on the chain link fence open and quickly slam shut. I take cover behind the mailbox and look back towards the house. I see an old white town car load up with what I thought were five men before it tears ass down the street, heading my way. I start sprinting to the police station and I can feel that my new acquaintances are driving slowly behind me. As I'm about a hundred yards away, they pull up right next to me, and I will admit, it freaked me out. I stop and look at the windows, but I couldn't make out any faces, only silhouettes. And that's when I hear one of them say my name, followed by, Don't even think about going into that police station and telling those pigs on us. To add insult to injury, they fire a paintball that hits me square in my chest. I'm pissed, but part of me thinks, how dumb are these guys? I clearly know where they live. I walk into the police station and tell my story to an officer on the front desk. He asked me if I got the license plate, but honestly, I didn't think to look at it when I was getting shot at. The officer gets the info from me on the house, and after researching it, he tells me that it's been foreclosed on, and that for well over two years, no one has lived there. That makes the poor condition of the house make a lot more sense to me. He says they'll check it out and get back to me, and offers to have an officer give me a ride home, which I accept. On the ride home, the officer explains to me that unfortunately, unless it happens again and they catch whoever did this in the act, they will probably never know for sure who shot me. He suggests that I keep an eye on my home also, being that whoever did this to me knew my name and possibly knew where I lived. He also warned me that they could potentially think it would be funny to keep up the harassment. At the time, I had no idea how right he would be about that. He suggested that I get a GoPro camera and just point it out the front window of my home at night. A very good idea, as it would turn out. He closes with suggesting that I don't run that way for a little bit also. That night, I shower and lay down to go to sleep. When I hear something that springs me to my second floor bedroom window, voices, and then the sound of several people jumping into my in-ground pool. I rush downstairs and flip my back porch light on and just barely see one person running from my pool to the side of my house. I continue to scan my yard, but no one is there. I spin around and rush to my front door and look outside. Just as I do, I can see three guys running down my lawn and beyond my line of sight past my neighbor's house, maniacally laughing as they do. I walk outside and run down my driveway, metal baseball bat in hand, and I look around, but these guys are long gone. I turn around, walking back up my driveway, and I see a white envelope taped to my front door. Thinking crime scene, I don't even touch it. I just call the police. Again. I sit outside with my bat, waiting for an officer to show. Which he does, 35 minutes later. It's roughly 11.30pm now. He asks if I touch the envelope, and I say no. He calls for a detective to come and take a look at it, and 10 minutes later, one shows up in an unmarked car. The detective puts on gloves and then grabs the envelope and carefully opens it up, being very concerned for the potential of a biohazard. It's just a folded piece of paper, but what it reads freaks me out. Check your tool shed. The detective and the officer walk to my backyard 
and tell me to stand back as they open it, guns drawn. When they do, there's a dead raccoon, covered in paintball shots, with a note underneath its lifeless body. They again open the note with the same care, and it reads, We told you not to go to the pigs. You're fucked now. And then it said my name. They also had trashed several of my items in there. This prompts the detective to actually call for backup, as they are taking this as a legitimate threat and want to see if they can find any prints. I should add, the town I had jogged in and reported the paintball shooting earlier, and the town I live in, are two different townships with two different police departments. This department, the one at my house, is aware of something that the other wasn't, apparently. A few nights ago, a mother and a father were jogging at night in a park, and they were passing by a white town car, and a group of guys inside yelled out at them, Your daughter gives great head! and said their names, before shooting them with paintballs. They reported it, and are waiting to hear back. It was a similar group of guys, the same car, and the same actions with the paintball guns. Time goes by, it's now Friday, and I haven't slept very well in two days, thinking I would be the victim of another random act of bullshit from these assholes. I get home from work Friday, and as I pull up to my house, I see that it has been vandalized. Someone spray painted my garage door with a hanging stick figure, like a hangman, and the puzzle has three letters. The first letter is Y, and the last is a U. So now they shot me, and I guess they want to hang me. Perfect. I, of course, call the police. They arrive, question the neighbors, who naturally either weren't home or saw nothing. They take a statement, and then they actually help me clean the paint off. The officer helping me says, Hey, this must have just happened, being the paint is still wet enough to be removed. The GoPro! His remark prompts me to remember taking the other officer up on his suggestion, and I had borrowed my cousin's GoPro the day before. We look at it, and now we have video of two guys walking up to my house in broad daylight and spray painting it. Problem was, you don't see them actually spray paint it, and they were wearing V for Vendetta masks. The officer takes the camera from me, well, from my cousin, and I guess they have something to go on. One step closer. Saturday, my friend Mike asked me to go to dinner with him, but I feel like I need to sit home and guard my house. He offers to drive, so it'll look like I'm home, but I really don't want to leave my house unattended, so we decide instead to have a barbecue at my house and have a few beers. We were sitting in my backyard, cooking up a couple of burgers and having a beer, when I see something out of my peripheral vision that makes me almost shit my pants. I see a guy in a V for Vendetta mask walking from the side of my house. I yell out, Shit! Mike, watch out! The guy doesn't do anything. He just does a one-fingered follow me motion. I will follow you. In fact, I'm gonna grab the tongs I use for meat and plunge them into your head if I can get over to you fast enough. Mike says, Let's kick his ass, and grabs a folding chair. This, believe it or not, scares the guy into running to my front yard. We run after him, and he sprints towards, you guessed it, the white town car, and it's parked in the street right in front of my house. I run for the car, and the V points behind me, making me look over my right shoulder. As I do, another guy in another V-mask is standing near my car on the driveway, 
and he bashes in the windshield with a tire iron. We run after him, and he sprints off around the block. We decide, forget it, let's go after the town car instead. We start running towards it, and one of the other guys in the back seat, wearing the same V-mask, rolls down the window and shows me that he's got a gun. I have no idea if it's real or another paintball gun, but it looks real. We don't mess around, and we hightail it back to my backyard and then into my house. But this time, Mike got a look at the license plate. He immediately writes down the number as I look outside. The car is gone. Mike and I, once again, call the police and they arrive in about six to seven minutes. We give them the plate number, but naturally, those plates are stolen. Another dead end. Finally, I guess I'm becoming a priority, and the police agree to stake out my house. They sit down my block in a black Ford Explorer, which you would never know is a police vehicle, for two days. Monday night, I get a knock at the door, and I slowly look outside. It's an undercover officer. I know, because I know all of them by now. I open my door for him, and he tells me that a person was walking up to my house with a letter, and it was a 15-year-old kid. The kid explains that he was given $150 to just knock on my door and hand me a letter, and he describes the guys who paid him and lets us know that they met just 10 minutes ago at the 7-Eleven by my house. They told the kid that they were with a law firm and were trying to serve me with legal documents, but couldn't do it themselves because I know their faces and wouldn't answer for them. The kid then says, You know, like the Pineapple Express, man. The kid's story turns out to be legit, but one detail they overlooked. The 7-Eleven has cameras. The detective goes to the 7-Eleven and looks at the footage. It turns out to be grainy, but this time, we got the real plates. Now the police know who the owner of the town car really is. They link it back to a guy that I have never heard of, who surprisingly lives not too far from me. The officers go to the house and arrest the man. It turns out, it's the old man I had originally saw the first night I got shot with the paintballs. He was home alone, but luckily, a few minutes later, the other four guys were pulled over about two blocks away in the town car. One of the other guys in the group is a kid I went to school with, Eric. A kid who used to get bullied a lot and believe it or not, I used to stick up for. It turns out, these guys were all living together in this house. Our theories were completely wrong. None of them were teenagers at all. All of these guys are ages ranging from 35 through 48. But here's the really scary part. The part that makes me lose sleep. Inside their house, they found a meth lab, an arsenal of weapons, and over $50,000 in cash, and a dead homeless man. They had chained him to a wall by his neck and shoulders and used him as target practice, painting him up to look like a clown. Above him, written on the wall, were the words, Shoot the Geek. The homeless man had been dead for several days, and it was determined that he was killed by a combination of internal injuries, starvation, and from bleeding out. These monsters had cut off his hands and one of his feet. These sick freaks let a person starve in their basement while they beat him to death and dismembered him. The police determined that this was most likely not their first time they had murdered someone, with 98% statistical certainty. 
from what I derived, if they would have gotten me captured in their home, it wouldn't have been their last time either. When word got out that the kid I went to high school with was linked to this story, it prompted a lot of people to talk about him, and sadly me, on social media. Several people I hadn't spoken to since graduation started contacting me. One being a girl that I'd went to school with, who claimed that back in 2000, Eric had raped her. It was dismissed as a typical he said, she said case. I, like everyone else, never knew this happened. She thanked me for helping to put him away. Another person, Kyle, had told me that him and Eric had gotten into a bar fight back in 2003. Eric had started the fight over a game of pool, and Kyle believed that after that evening, Eric was damaging his car at night, keying it and flattening his tires, but he could never prove it. Eric is serving a staggering, but appropriate, 52-year sentence for felony murder, home invasion, criminal stalking, criminal trespassing, accessory to murder, vandalism, and driving a car with a stolen license plate, as well as several other charges. If he survives prison, he will be 87 when he breathes his first breath of freedom again. All right, everybody. So, um, I think we're going to wind this stream down right there. Been live over three hours, and as that last story was going, I got a knock on the door, which happened to be one of my Christmas gifts from my grandma, which is, uh, some really good steaks and whatnot. It's like a whole, uh, package of steaks, sausages, burgers, chicken, all kinds of stuff. So I actually got to put that away. Because it's in a styrofoam container with, I hope, a freezer packet. But it should be a whole bunch of raw meat. So I really got to make sure I put that away and everything. Filet mignon, all that good stuff. I'm excited. It's going to be fun to grill it all up. I appreciate everyone dropping in and uh, listening to some of these old stories. As well as the stories that will be up on the channel tomorrow. Uh, for those of you that want to continue listening but yeah, aren't. Uh, if you go to Patreon, you can find the perk to actually, it's a $5 patron perk that'll get you all my unlisted videos. So all the videos we've been listening to, plus like another 23 hours worth of content that you're not going to find if you're looking, you can get that as a perk on Patreon. If you just do the $1, you get early access, exclusive patron only streams, all that kind of stuff. It's the more optimal way, I should say, to support the creators. So, for those of us getting hit with the demonetization issues, we can still keep putting out the same videos. Like the 911 video is a good example. I work so much on those kind of videos, it's crazy. Like, I put probably four times as much video or time into working on a 911 video as I would a normal video, if not more. And, you know, I put that up not getting paid just because it's all fun to see people's reactions. It was really nice. I was super pumped. You can even ask uh, all the people on our Discord. I, I'm super pumped about people getting views. Even though I'm not getting paid, I'm so pumped that people are actually seeing it because I put so much time into that. Like, that's one of my favorite videos. I've literally listened to that probably 10 times, not even exaggerating, 10 times, including going through trying to fix it all. So it's nice to actually uh, be able to do those kind of things for y'all. I can't do them all the time because if I did, I would never make a goddamn thing. So I'd be working for free every freaking day. So uh, I got to mix it up with some stories and I even got to dumb down the titles. Because like I said, I've had two hours of content up for you guys and ready to publish. But YouTube's just saying it's not advertiser friendly. So this video you got today, I literally uploaded the same video and just changed and took out paranormal out of the title. And just put creature and ghost stories or something like that and it didn't trigger so uh paranormal seems to be a trigger for youtube interestingly enough but i kind of vent regardless i do appreciate y'all checking out this video 
live stream, I guess I should say. It's not really a video, but I appreciate everyone chilling with me, checking out the old school videos, uh, where we came from in the channel, back when I recorded on a cell phone, all that good stuff. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. I know a lot of you are working, a lot of you are getting off work, so I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Send love out to those that are uh, having a hard time. I know there was a few people in the chat that were having some rough times family-wise, so I want to send some love out to you guys. I, I do appreciate it, for sure. <laughs> Margo says, ah, oh, Merry Christmas with meat. And that's the best way to do it for a guy. I gotta put this, oh, I'm so excited, man. I've been waiting for it, I've been looking. Like, it came with a, the gift was in a, a tin, but it was the piece of paper telling me what everything I got, so I was all excited. I know I got filet mignon, I got steaks, I got chicken, I got sausages, kibasha, like, er, I don't even know if it's kibashas. I don't eat kibash, kibashis? I don't know what the fuck they're called. But I'm gonna eat them, because they're good, I hope. Regardless, I'm eating them. But yeah, I got a big old thing of meat I got to put away. Make sure it's all good. So, uh, Yeah, I appreciate y'all sticking around doing this. I, I want to do more of these live streams. I do a lot of live streams, so if you aren't uh, notified of the channel, make sure you have the bell notification clicked. Even if you do, it might not notify you because that's the way YouTube works. So uh, I guess we just got to deal with it. But uh, hope everyone has a wonderful day, and I will catch you all in the next video. Appreciate you. Bye. Bad bye.